Oh my goodness, guys, 600K. That is how many people follow this channel now, and I just wanna say thank you guys so much. Without you guys, I would not be doing this, so for real, thank you guys so much for the support. Just wow, I don't know what to say, like this is insane. I never thought the channel would come this far, but here we are. <laughs> To celebrate, we're going to be doing a speedrun of BL3, and this is not going to be a normal kind of speedrun. In fact, on my channel, I've done a bunch of speedruns in the past, and this one's going to be something a little more special. Now, I know a lot of people aren't really fans of the BL3 story, but I can assure you, you're not going to learn anything from this speedrun in terms of the uh, story content. We're going to be flying through this game extremely fast and using very, very cool, very precise tricks. With that in mind, this is not actually a single segment speedrun, you know, I didn't do it in one session sitting down. This is actually going to be a segmented speedrun, so I did all the parts separately and then linked them all together in editing. With that in mind, I can go ahead and do these very, very precise tricks, and if I happen to screw up, I can just back up the save and try it again. So, segmented depends on the game you're playing, but for this game, it's basically each time I save quit, I back up my save and I just keep trying that next segment until I get it right. So yeah, with that in mind, I can do these crazy tricks and make this run even more enjoyable to watch. My goal was to make the speedrun, you know, enjoyable to watch and make it kind of a visual experience. I mean, I might as well talk about the time of the run now because you can see the length of the video, but this run is done in two hours and 32 minutes, which is actually insane for its time. To put that time into a perspective, the world record for a single segment run for this game is just over three hours. Yeah, this run is going to be over a half an hour faster, and I'm not claiming world record with this run. Like I said, it is segmented, and also, I did actually use a couple mods. Now, before you freak out and say, oh no, modded run, this is uh, not legit, you know, whatever, again, I'm not going for world record. And the mods I used helped me speed up getting this run done. A little backstory, I've been working on this run for over 6 months and constantly rerouting it and writing different ideas down on paper. Um, I realized during the routing of the run I had to get very very specific items to make these, you know, cool tricks work. With that in mind, I reset over and over to get a legendary out of a chest or a certain item out of a vendor. We're talking about like hundreds of resets. I realized at that point that this run was going to take a very very long time to do. So yeah, there are a couple mods. Now, some of the mods make drops guaranteed, so if I kill a boss, they will always drop their legendary. And for another mod, you can make, you know, the slot machine give you a snowdrift early on. Now, for the mods, I did make sure I can, you know, get items that legit roll at that point in the game. So you're not going to see anything like impossible to roll pistols that do a bajillion damage in one shot. Again, these are legit items that can roll if you were to reset many, many times. Without the mods, I'd be working on this speedrun for probably over a year. I didn't really have that kind of time. Anyways, I do want to give a huge thanks to Garwood, he was the guy who actually made the mods. So thank you for saving me from doing hundreds and hundreds of resets to get this run done. Also, I do want to give a huge thanks to the BL3 speedrunning community. I also thank you to Septics, Garwood, Apple, and many others for helping me, you know, route this speedrun. The last thing I want to mention is you might notice load screens are very, very short. That is because for time, load screens don't actually count, so we just cut those out during editing. It makes for a better and more fluent run, and honestly, nobody wants to watch loading screens. Anyways, time starts when you pick up the Echo and ends when you trigger the Tyrene cutscene. This time around, I'm going to be commentating this whole entire run, so I will try my best to explain what's happening on your screen. At this point, the commentary is going to slow down a little bit, but I will explain things when they happen. Uh, so right now, Claptrap is, you know, slowly taking his time to walk over and trigger a bunch of dialogue. Sadly, for this part, you cannot actually save, quit, and skip it. You gotta wait until Claptrap says, uh, we did it, I did it, another, and then after he says another, you can save, quit at that point. Save quits in this game are very, very precise, like you have to wait until a certain trigger to save quit. So to burn time and do something fun, uh, we are just going to go out of bounds and do a weird elevator glitch here. Uh, so yeah, during like downtime, we're going to be doing like funny tricks just for the heck of it. So yeah, if you jump into this corner, you can jump backwards over and over and kind of get your way up over this gate. And you might be thinking, oh, you can skip the door or something like that. No, it doesn't matter. You can't actually get back and bounce at this point. So instead, I actually took the time to go out of bounds and show you a hidden out of bounds mailbox. Why is it there? I don't know, but you can actually open it and get ammo out of it. It's just a normal mailbox. And I must say, getting out of bounds here, it is quite pretty. They actually put quite a bit of detail, like a windmill in the background or sorry, turbine or something. I don't know what you want to call that. And there's this floating tank, I don't know what it is, but I guess you can see it from a certain angle possibly. Either way, really, really cool. Now, even though the jitter sliding is a little bit annoying to watch for some people, sliding even on flat ground is still faster than running. So we're going to be doing that quite a bit. But yeah, there's the mailbox, we shoot it, we see a piece of ammo, Claptrap says another, so we go for the save quit. A pretty cool thing here is for the red trunk chest, you can shoot those and actually open them up from range. So we don't have to wait for those to open up. 
And now this is going to be our first major glitch of the run, which is actually swap reloading. If you have a full magazine when you aim down sight, swap away, swap back, your gun automatically reloads. Now it is an infinite ammo, it's still consuming ammo. But you can skip your reload animation and we can take advantage of these zip rockets. For the mobbing, it's pretty complicated with the random spawns, you know, the random enemies you get. So it did take many resets to make sure we didn't get any psycho enemies to have that sporadic movement, because they are a pain to hit. For the most part, most of the enemies spawn in these same locations, so after many, many resets, you can kind of memorize their spawn patterns. My goodness, yeah, you can see the zip rockets are ridiculous, and you're only supposed to get five of those, and then it goes on a long cooldown, but swap reloading, it's a thing. And this will be one of the first crazy RNG moments. Um, this chest can spawn purple shields. So using a mod, we did roll what could theoretically happen. And that is a triple Vagabond shield for 24% movement speed when the shield is full. Also, we did perform the first dialogue skip. So if you open that red chest as soon as Claptrap starts talking, then Shiv will kick in early and open the door early for you. Now, as for the Shiv fight, this could have been like a tiny bit better, but Shiv's RNG is so, so bad. But the main thing you want is to hit the barrel into Shiv and have it hit the electric generator too. He will take a nasty fire and shock damage over time and you easily get the kill. We'll go ahead and speed equip our clone and drone and get our perfectly rolled white rarity Jacob shotgun. We'll do a bit of parkour and make our way up here and we're actually going to do a clone warp here just for the heck of it. It doesn't save time but it looks really cool. We put clone on the floor, hit the button when it turns green, and then we go down and revive Claptrap as soon as he lands. And after that, yep, we go for the save quit. Dialogue is slow so yeah, we save quit that. Now we're going to be safe quitting a bunch of dialogue, so now is a perfect time to explain why we are playing Zane. For a BL3 speedrun, there's two things you want to have, and that is damage and speed. Hey, guess what? Zane has both of those as a tier 1 skill. Not only that, Gearbox buffed uh, Cold Board to do 200% cryo damage for whatever reason, so we're going to be taking advantage of that. Remember, we're swap reloading, so every time we swap, we're activating that Cold Board cryo damage, and we're going to be taking advantage of that once we hit level 3. As for the speed, we're going to grab the Violent Speed skill once we hit a higher level. So right now, our movement speed's only based on, you know, the Vagabond shield we have, and also sliding. Now we talk to Lilith, because everybody loves doing that in BL3. And as for this mobbing, it took a lot of tries to get this segment right. The spawns here are going to be random. So our main goal is to make sure that we can get the crits and get those ricochet pellets hitting. And even though we did roll a perfectly parted high damage Jacob shotgun, it consumes three ammo per shot. So we do have to be a little bit conservative on the ammo. So the main thing here is to mob fast and also make sure Lilith doesn't walk all the way over to that mobbing area. If she does, well, she's going to have to run all the way back to this, you know, very spot. And that's very, very slow. Now from here, there is literally nothing we can do except wait for Lilith to go all the way to the door, activate the TV, and let us travel to the next map. In the meantime, we're just going to run around, loot stuff, and just wait for her to get done. Now, I do want to bring up the mobbing for this uh, speedrun isn't, like, perfect. You know, this is not, like, a tools-assisted speedrun. It is as close to a tools-assisted speedrun as we can get uh, for human abilities. So, you know, when you see me mobbing and I miss one shot, you know, I'm not going to reset if I miss one single bullet. If I happen to miss like three or more shots, then yeah, I'm going to reset the segment and try again. But for the most part, if the mobbing was decently fast, then I'm going to go ahead and count it for the segment. The children of the vault. Also, we're going to set Lilith on fire because she's the Firehawk, right? Makes perfect sense. She's going to slowly make her way to the door. And from here, there is actually an invisible trigger. You got to stand by her and the door when um, she makes it over. And that will trigger her next set of dialogue. Like I said, there's not a whole lot we can do here except for loot stuff while waiting, so we're just going to open every container we can find and just wait. I would do exciting, you know, glitches and tricks for this map, but there's not really a whole lot that we know of. Plus, we do have to make sure we have shotgun ammo because this thing does consume 3 ammo per shot. The beginning story is very slow paced, but it's going to pick up pretty quick here in a bit. And once we get towards the end of the run, I don't even know if I'm going to keep up with the commentary to explain what is going on. Uh, we're going to be flying at the speed of light, basically. For now though, it's at a pretty good pace and I can keep up with what's going on. Oh, I should mention too, we also need money, so we need to make sure we're scavenging for money or, you know, selling things for money too. There are parts in this run where we do have to buy stuff from the vendor and, yeah, we need money. Ship's almost done blabbering away, just have to wait a little bit longer. And right here is something stupid, um, when the door opens a small amount, we're gonna place clone and teleport through, and it saves one third of a second. I'll open the gate. Yeah, it's almost not worth it, but hey, we're trying to go fast. Door is open, and we can go to the next map. So the excessive save quitting is not only to skip dialogue, but also lock in my segment. And I can also refresh my action skills to make sure I have those full when I uh, load back in. From here, we're going to run through the drought, and it's really annoying in this game. You spawn in, and everything starts as a low texture, and it's super laggy. 
With that happening, it actually eats input sometimes, and it can, like, stop your slides from happening, and it's not a good time. Anyways, pick up the uh, mission there, because for whatever reason, with that mission active, it will skip the mobbing after you meet Vaughn. So you don't actually have to kill those skags and have Vaughn proceed forward. You can just skip it entirely. Along the way, we're going to get small bits of XP by killing enemies, and here is a small parkour skip. You can actually jump on that bottom crate there and spam jump, and by doing that, you can get all the way up the crate. Now, if you don't spam jump, you will fall off that first crate, so yeah, you gotta make sure you're mashing when you uh, jump on that. We make our way over to Vaughn, and we're gonna shoot him down and go for the save quit, because Vaughn talks a lot. I think it's like over a minute of dialogue. It's ridiculous. Even in real time, you save quitting still faster. I'm sure it's even faster still on console if you save quit there, with the uh, loading times and whatnot. Now, I don't think I mentioned it earlier, but we are using the Broken Hearts event, because the hearts actually do help a little bit with the mobbing. I didn't actually realize this until like halfway through the run, but I thought that the hearts gave you XP too, but I guess they don't. Either way, they still help for mobbing, so we're going to keep that on for the run. We talk to Vaughn, and from here, it's all animation based. Vaughn has to run from there all the way to Lilith, and it's a long, long run. For a speed run, we got to make sure we stay on level and not get under level too much. So we are going to take a detour while Vaughn's running over and get some XP. Also, there is an invisible trigger right here. You have to run through this area. If you don't, Vaughn's going to stop at the top of the drop down and not actually move and you have to run back and trigger him. On top of that, if you get too far from NPCs, they will stop moving, so we got to make sure we're not too far away. That means we'll take a small bit of time to make these skags mad and get a little bit of XP with my drone. From there, we'll use some clever parkour and actually get into the LA area early. On top of the hill is another red chest, and with crazy luck, you can roll a world drop vanquisher early game. Again, the speedrun is for entertainment purposes, so this is theoretically possible in single segment, but not very likely. So now that we're in the LA area early, we're going to run back to the back area and get the Claptrap, and that's going to give a lot of XP. Not only that, you also get a bit of Iridium, and we are going to need Iridium for early game to buy stuff from Crazy Old Spender, but we'll get to that later on once we get to Sanctuary. With the Vanquisher, we can slide 20% faster, and that's more movement speed for the uh, speedrun. This clone teleport right here doesn't save time, but I just did it because it looks cool. Um, we gotta burn a few more seconds here because Vaughn is taking forever. And now, this is going to be our first photo mode trick here. So right now, Claptrap is splattering away, but his dialogue isn't very, very long. So what we're gonna do is enter photo mode and unpause photo mode. And what this does is makes Claptrap's dialogue infinite over everybody else's. So basically, Lilith cannot talk, uh, Vaughn cannot talk, nobody can talk except for Claptrap right now. What that's gonna do is, because nobody can talk except for Claptrap, uh, it will skip both of their dialogue, allowing you to talk to her a lot earlier. That means we can turn in the mission and go for the save quit and skip the next set of dialogue. Also in photo modes, flipping the camera and the colors and stuff doesn't do anything. I just did it because why not? Now we're going to make our way over to Ellie's and grab the car. And I do want to recap the beginning of the run real quick. Uh, it did happen really fast, but I did disable guardian rank right at the beginning of the run. You can see it for a split second, so if you are wondering if there is Guardian Rank, there is no Guardian Rank for this run. It is done with the default stats, so no Guardian Rank perks or anything like that. In traditional BL3 speedrunning, you don't actually use Guardian Rank, so I just kind of wanted to follow those rules. We're going to throw a drone out again, because drone is nice for getting some XP along the way, so you don't have to stop and kill stuff yourself. And we're about to perform a really cool trick for segmented. You don't want to do this for single segment speedruns. If you do, you're going to get trapped. So you can place your clone through this window into this area. And you're not supposed to get in here, but you can get the car spawn early and take it before, you know, the door even opens. And that's going to save a small amount of time, but it looks really, really cool. Right here, I really wanted to get the corkscrew with the car, but I already reset, I think, over 30 or 40 times at that point. So I was kind of like trying to get the segment done and I didn't want to risk, um, you know, doing the car flip there because it might screw up the segment. Anyways, park the car, hop out, get the scan, activate the thingy, and you will unlock the dump truck side mission. Now we'll grab the dump truck side mission because we do want to get the overpowered TK's wave. Uh, for whatever reason, Gearbox gave this weapon Norfleet some amounts of damage, so we're going to want that for, you know, a speed run. Now it did happen really fast there, but I did speed spec my skill into cold boars, so now we can swap our weapon and swap back and get the bonus cryo damage on our shot. Remember, we're swap reloading and cold boar is stupidly OP for early game, so that's going to give us a lot more damage. We'll do a nice bit of parkour and make our way up to the dump truck really fast. And from here, we're going to stand on the refrigerator and line up a nice crit. And with four really nice shots, you can kill him fast. So we'll pull off the kill and he's going to drop a perfectly parted fire TK's wave. From here, we'll finish off the side mission and get a bit of XP. And then we're going to farm this mini boss for a small amount of time for some bonus XP. 
remember, we gotta make sure we stay on level, so we gotta do the most efficient XP farms there is. So our goal is to hit five and a half, and then we can proceed to the Ascension Bluffs. So this is just gonna be a rinse and repeat farm until we get there. Now, when I say they overbuffed the shotgun to do Northfleet damage, I am not exaggerating. Watch. Dump truck. One shot, dead. Yeah. That plus cold bore is ridiculous damage. Now, I don't want to sound like a whiny baby through the run, you know, saying, wow, this is OP or whatever, but I do question the logic and testing behind this buff because grabbing one of these things for early game is game breaking. Maybe the reason for the buff is to make it work on Mayhem 10, but yeah, it breaks the flow of early game. That is not a bad thing for a speed run, though. I'm okay with that. For a casual play, though, I would probably avoid this gun, you know, to have a challenge. Also, only the TK wave part of it got the buff, so if you find a Tidal Wave, the other variant, that one is still decently strong, but not as strong as the TK wave. Um, this weapon can roll non-elemental, shock, and fire, which is pretty nice. Because I know I get a one-shot every time, I can just shoot it and go for the save quit right away and not worry about, you know, getting a hit marker or something. So yeah, for the run, we're mostly going to be focused on low mag Jacob shotguns that do high damage, because with the swap reloading and cold bore, we're going to get a lot out of them. Um, TK's wave is actually going to last me, no joke, all the way to Skywell. No joke, level 18 enemies are still going to get one-shotted by this level 4 shotgun. Anyways, spec 1 point into cold bore and 1 point into violent speed. Uh, damage at this point is fine, so we're going to focus the skill points and the speed at this time. Now, that did happen pretty quick. You might be wondering how we got back to the beginning of the map. After we killed Dump Truck, I did fast travel back to the beginning and then went for a save quit immediately. As soon as your inventory closes and even before the warp tunnel pops up, uh, your character is already at that fast travel, so we can just save quit and skip the warp tunnel animation. That does save time. Now there's nothing left to do except for head to Ascension Bluffs and take on Mouthpiece. Um, this run could actually be a little bit faster if I went for this really boring strat, and that is to get a world drop Hellwalker always on level, you know, every chest, every vendor, but I don't think that would be enjoyable to watch. Um, again, I want this to be a visual experience, so I did use a bunch of different shotguns and items for the run, and strats too. Having a Hellwalker always on level throughout the whole entire speedrun would be very boring to watch. That is my opinion. So, we're good on XP now, which means we can race our way over to the waypoint. That's actually another thing I should mention is this game is all about the waypoints. You go from waypoint A to waypoint B, and in a speedrun you want to do that as fast as possible. That means by going in the straightest line to waypoint A to waypoint B, um, that can be achieved by going out of bounds or just driving there in a straight line. Then later on we're actually going to be doing some really cool tricks such as uh, pestilence flying, but we'll get to that when we get there. We'll go ahead and hop out the car and destroy it because just like all the other games in the series, destroying your car gives you a kill skill which means more speed from our violent speed skill. Why is that a thing? I have no idea, but it's been a thing for a while. We'll grab the claptrap because free XP along the way, hit the save, and split that segment. Now, if you do recall, we do have a triple vagabond shield which means if our shield is full we get 24% movement speed, but as you know, during combat that shield is easily going to get tagged and, you know, you lose that movement speed bonus. I took the time to reset this segment many, many times to make sure we got through this area without taking a bullet. And honestly, it was painful and probably not worth it. Alright, we're going to go ahead and do our first really cool clone teleport here. You can jump and place it at the top and then teleport up. And what that does is allows you to go through the backdoor area to mouthpiece. And it's going to be a lot faster and safer than going the normal way. Um, some waypoints are a lie, you don't have to listen to those, but basically, you drop down, trigger the cutscene, so we gotta go ahead and, uh, simulate that. And we'll, uh, go ahead and start the easiest fight in the world. So, you can see here, if you get the first shot off early, you can go ahead and start the second cycle early. Um, he does that same pattern every time. Uh, from now, we gotta wait for the immune phase, so we're gonna go ahead and get some extra XP from the tanks. And then we'll, uh, finish off the fight. There we go, level 6. That is exactly what we want. Take the key, and we're gonna go ahead and teleport back to the beginning of the map after we kill off these, uh, tanks. So basically, right now, we cannot do anything except wait for Tyrene talk, and we cannot travel away from this map until Lilith talks. So, just like before, we're gonna go XP hunting and make sure we stay on level for the run. We're gonna sell off the garbage and make sure we keep up on the money for the run. You'll notice here, I do keep that Hyperion Longbow Grenade. That is gonna be a small time save later on once we get to Eden 6, but we'll get to that when we get there. Right now, Tyrene should be talking, but she got deleted for some reason. I think the vendor might have cut her off with the dialogue. Oh, there she is. So, we're gonna kill Scrack real fast, get the XP, and then we'll, um, get out of here. Trigger the area where Scrack spawns, there we go. Let's go back to the car, and we're gonna finish off this kill. I'm pretty sure a lot of you guys have seen this kind of kill. You just get in the car, back up a bit, and he's gonna hover in place. And then you can easily rocket him down and finish off the last bit. Now, if you kill enemies in a car, you get way less XP, so we gotta make sure we hop out at the, uh, last little bit. So, we'll hop out and get that shot off and finish off the kill. And honestly, I should've sticked with the, uh, Vanquisher there, it doesn't really matter. So we're waiting for Lilith to pop up right now. We'll just uh, watch that corner. 
there she is so we can head out of here and go back to the droughts. Also, map management in this game is not really the best, but as long as you memorize where all the maps are in terms of uh, their positions, you can go ahead and uh, just click that spot early and know exactly where you want to travel. From here, we do have to talk to Lilith quite a few times, so we're just going to talk to her and go straight for the save quit. Just to be a tiny bit creative, I did make my way to her three different ways. All three of the paths over to her are pretty much the same speed, so it doesn't really matter which one you do. Now, this one's one of my favorites just because it looks really cool, but you can actually jump and place clone through the window and then teleport up. The only issue is after the save quit, Vaughn's right there in your way, so you gotta make sure you kind of uh, maneuver around him so you don't bump into him. Even more save quitting because dialogue. And then finally, the last way here is gonna be the most optional. You place clone, and then you can go up to the top and talk to her through the window. Sounds kind of creepy, I know. Uh, anyways, so yeah, we'll teleport back and grab our car. Speed spec our point into even more violent speed for the uh, run speed when you get a kill. And now we gotta head over to Tannis and do even more mobbing. Now, this is gonna be one of our first really long mobbing segments. And sadly, I'm only human, so there's no perfect way to get the perfect cycles and the perfect enemy spawns. Uh, we're talking thousands and thousands of resets to get that, so... I just went with the best mobbing segment I could pull off. And honestly, it was pretty decent. I didn't miss too many shots, and the enemies cooperated pretty well. We'll trigger that waypoint and just go straight for the save quit to skip that dialogue. I do have a fun fact, if you would call it fun, because it's actually quite annoying. When you talk to NPCs, you want to talk to them right away, like as soon as you approach them. Because most NPCs have idle dialogue in which they just kind of blabber about whatever, kind of like what I'm doing right now. For example, Tannis can be like, nice weather we're having, and then she will um, not let you give her the vault key right away. Like, you have to wait for that dialogue to pass. So obviously for a speedrun, you just mash as soon as you get in front of the NPC to make sure they uh, take the objective. Anyway, so you can see there we level up again, which is going to give us a level up bonus. And that's going to give us 100% more weapon damage for, I think it's like a minute or 30 seconds, I can't recall. But either way, it's not really going to matter because we are, you know, mobbing with a very OP weapon. Speaking of the tidal wave, it is quite hard to use because of the bullet pattern, so you got to make sure you are point blank in front of the enemy's face. Uh, if I try to snipe, you know, long range, it's not going to work too well. But yeah, you can see there with just one bullet tagging the enemy, it ended up killing them. Also, clone is not only nice for skips, but also for getting to uh, different places so I can, you know, efficiently mob these enemies. Now, one thing here that did cause a lot of resets for this segment is Lilith. If she teleports up top and uh, stops the enemies from jumping down because they're going to focus on her instead, then that means it will slow down the combat and, you know, not be good for the run. In case you are wondering, you cannot actually parkour your way up top and, you know, kill the enemies as soon as they spawn. That would have been nice if you could. I did actually try to get a Jacob Sniper and snipe them as soon as they spawn, but it did not work out pretty well. They just did not get one-shotted. Anyways, we're approaching the final uh, couple enemies here, and as soon as we get that, we're going to teleport straight to the highway. Now, the reason why we're doing this is because we're going to pick up a side mission. Remember, if random dialogue is overlapping the main dialogue, that means the main dialogue cannot talk and proceed the mission forward. So we're going to pick up the Undertaker side mission, and Vaughn's going to talk over Lilith and Tannis. With that in mind, they cannot talk, and it allows us to get the objective early. Now, the objective is blocked off. You're not normally supposed to get to it right here yet, but we're speedrunning. We break the rules. So, what we're going to do is make our way to the back area of this uh, waypoint. Park about right there. It doesn't really matter. And then we're going to use a clever clone teleport up to the top area. And I got to say, this clone teleport barely makes it up. Like, you have to jump and then place clone at the top of your, uh, your jump height. Uh, also, right there, I tried to kill my car. It doesn't really matter. You still have to wait anyways, so yeah, speed doesn't matter at that point. So we're at the next waypoint, and we skip most of the dialogue with that side mission. Waypoint is triggered. We go back to the highway, and we go for that save quit. Yeah, whenever there's a blue warp tunnel, we usually want to save quit to skip over that anyways. All right, so from here, we do have to kill 10 skags by running them over, and this segment took a lot of resets. I wanted god RNG for the skags, and we actually got that in this segment, so that's pretty cool. The spawns were pretty much perfect, and we took them out pretty fast. There's seven, eight, nine, and we only need one more. From here, we'll get the final one and proceed with the uh, car skip over this rock. Now, this skip is really precise. If you don't turn at the right angle there, you're not going to make it over. Uh, we did end up getting it and getting down, and if you're not fast enough when you do that, the level 12 Skagzilla car will spawn in that area and end up killing your car. Or destroying, sorry. I don't know why I say killing when it's not alive, but yeah. Anyways, parkour skip up to the top area instead of going around quite a bit faster. I tried to kill my car there again, but fire on armor did not really work all that great, so we never got the speed there, but that's okay. It's only a small amount of speed. We got the chip, so let's go for that save quit and make our way back to Ellie. Now, when you spawn the bio rig, it does take a second to teleport to the car. Um, you'll see there, I tried to run over to the claptrap. I tried everything in my power to grab it before the uh, car spawn actually happens. 
but you just don't have the speed and to be honest at this point the claptrap doesn't give a lot of xp Flawless speed are on a very specific xp route so i don't want to get too much xp and skill the uh story missions for the main story we're going to be just under leveled for a little bit but towards the end of the game we're going to be like seven levels under or something as long as you have enough damage and are getting those one shots who cares now you'll see right there i did go forward and skip over the scan that wasn't an accident um, we have to trigger a save point in front of that area to make sure we spawn there when we save quit. So after we hit that, we backed up and uh, scanned the car. From here, we trigger the cutscene and do the uh, clone teleport one more time. And at this point, you might notice my game's getting a little bit framey. And that is because in this game, if you save quit too many times, uh, the game gets laggier and laggier. I do think it is a memory leak. Most people don't really encounter this, but after you save quit hundreds of times for uh, segments, yeah, you'll, you'll notice it then. At that point, I probably should have just reset my game and, uh, you know, got my frame rate back, but not a big deal. Anyways, the spawns here are fixed. Uh, not the enemies, but the spawns, so I know exactly where they're gonna be, uh, as soon as they pop up. From here, Drone's gonna finish off that final guy in the back, and we'll take on the final enemy up here. Now, this guy is random, and ideally you wanna get the tank. He's the, uh, fastest for jumping down. But I ended up getting these really good snipes on this segment to, uh, finish off the enemy before they even jump down. Also, I found out you can emote during revives, which is kind of funny. From here, it is going to be a little bit of save quit simulator to make sure we can skip over that dialogue. And then we'll go ahead and jump back in and talk to Ellie to proceed over to Sanctuary. Now, there is going to be a small parkour skip here, which, drumroll please, saves half a second. Oh my goodness, the time save. Uh, I don't recommend doing this skip because it's very precise. You can easily fall off and never get that uh, mantle. But if you do pull it off, it does look pretty cool. So we'll fade out and get the cutscene, and I do want to mention cutscenes do count towards time during the speedrun because they are in-game rendered. Uh, the only thing that doesn't count is loading screens and the main menu. Now, Sanctuary is not an exciting place for BL3, it's just go here, talk to that guy, go over there, talk to that guy. It's just a big safe quit simulator, so nothing's really going to happen, except for a bunch of dialogue. But after Sanctuary, the action does pick up quite a bit, we're going to be uh, heading to Promethea. Sanctuary is quite interesting, there is a lot of routes you can take to the uh, waypoints. I actually painfully went through and tested every single route I could think of and see what was faster. And right here, if you have enough speed, you can make your way back to your clone with a clone teleport and finish off the Tannis objective for this area. Also, we are going to grab the science side mission for a little XP and also a dialogue skip later on. We'll melee the thing and then go for the save quit. Now, I do want to apologize for the pacing of this video. There is a lot happening and I feel the need to explain everything. So, sorry for the super fast paced commentary. I think earlier on I said I was gonna like, you know, slow down a bit. I, may I lied. <laughs> for a run like this, things are happening really fast and for certain reasons. And yeah, it's only gonna get faster later on. You'll notice right there, Axton's actually talking in the corner. That is gonna be the arms face dialogue telling you to pick up the mission, but we're not gonna do that. Why you might ask? Well, that dialogue can be used for dialogue skipping later on. So thank you Axton for speeding up the speed run. All right, back to the run. Just like any interaction, you want to save quit to skip that dialogue. I think I've mentioned that probably a hundred times. That's kind of the uh, gist of a BL3 speed run. Um, right now, we're going to head to Crazy Earl and, you know, activate the waypoint and also get ourselves a pretty OP shield. Again, this is the Crazy RNG mod, but this can theoretically roll if you're lucky. And that shield, I did look at it for a second to, you know, make sure it's visually seeable for you guys. Yes, it does waste a tiny bit of time not, you know, buying it right away. But again, I want this to be a visual experience and you guys to uh, understand what's going on. That was a triple fleet shield. So if my shield is depleted, the opposite of uh, Vagabond shields, then I get that 24% movement speed all the time. Like I mentioned earlier, Vagabond's only going to give you that speed if the shield is full. So if you take one bit of damage, then that speed is gone. For fleet though, we're going to have our shield down all the time thanks to... Well, it's kind of a spoiler, but we're approaching that part of the run anyways. We're going to be picking up a um, Infiltrator class mod. And with the uh, Legendary Infiltrator, if you use your action skill, you break your shield. With that in mind, we can keep our shield down all the time on demand, and we will have that 24% movement speed no matter what, even running through combat. The issue is though, we're going to have no shield for pretty much the whole entire run, which means we are going to be very, very squishy. In fact, a lot of segments had to be redone because I have no survivability, and that means a lot of fight for your life. Thank goodness this is segmented, so if I screw up, I can just redo the segment. The final thing about that shield is it does have action skill and fire for the anoint. Action skill and fire is going to be the most useful for the run, so we're going to have that pretty much all the way until Eden 6. Now, the reason why we're not putting it on right now is because we still have the TK's wave and we're one-shotting everything. And like I said before, we don't have the infiltrator just yet, so we got to wait until we get that first. All right, so right here, we're going to place clone and head back to the science machine. And we're not doing the science machine to get the booster. We're using it for dialogue skipping. 
So by activating the science machine at the right time, you can have Tana's dialogue overlap Tyrion and Troy. And we're going to use that to skip one full second of dialogue. Not a game-changing amount, but again, this is a speed run, so we're going to do that. Most of this is animation based, so we have to wait for the TV to turn off, and you can't save quit this part, and you can't, you know, dialogue skip over it. So we're just gonna mess around in photo mode for a bit, waiting for that dialogue and animations to pass. Uh, Lilith, you are the bane of this run? Like, I like Lilith, don't get me wrong, but man, she really, really holds you hostage for a, uh, a speed run. Nice nose. So yeah, we're gonna use that dialogue to skip over Tyrene and- Oh, actually, I lied, it's skipping over Lilith right here, and Claptrap. Uh, not Tyrene Troy, sorry about that. So they got skipped over by Tannis, which means we can activate this travel a little bit faster. One second faster. The Borderlands Science Machine will give me a level up, and that's going to be nice for approaching the next map. And we'll go ahead and speed spec that skill into even more violent speed. From here, traveling to Promethea is animation based, so we cannot save quit this either, otherwise it'll reset all those animations. So in the meantime, we're going to go ahead and buy some shotgun ammo because that's going to be our main weaponry for the whole entire run. Don't worry though, we're not only using shotguns for the whole run, there's going to be some other cool tricks uh, later on. And I can't wait to show this off. So yeah, we just sold some garbage for the money and we're going to head back to Lilith because we got to talk to her one more time here before we head off. Oh, also, if you save quit right here, it will uh, make you re-travel back to Promethea, so we got to wait that out. We'll go ahead and boop her on the nose a few times and after we turn in the mission, we can save quit and safely head to uh, Promethea. Just a little bit longer. And there we go, save quit. All right, now we'll save quit one more time here to skip a little more dialogue, and then we're finally off to Promethea. Don't worry guys, the Sanctuary segment is done for now, so on to the action. I mentioned it early on, but yeah, sliding is a lot faster than running, and when you're going down slopes, you definitely want to slide. Now we'll talk to Ellie and head off to Promethea. Now, funny thing there with Ellie, she has this weird thing, it's not idle dialogue, but she has to turn all the way around and like look directly at you before you can talk to her. Sometimes, though, like you saw there, you could talk to her right away and then proceed on. I'm still not sure to this day what causes it, but yeah, we did get that for the uh, speedrun. Now we're going to proceed through, and you might notice I'm not holding Vanquisher and sliding through all the combat. I need to make sure I stay on level or just under level, so we do need to get a little bit of XP along the way. Luckily, these enemies are pretty still when they spawn in, so we can easily line up our shots. We'll place Clone there, grab the Claptrap for the bonus XP, and then teleport back. Just a few more kills here as we make our way to Lorelei, and then we can proceed on with the car segment. Now, in a geared speed run, you can fly through this area so fast, you can get a dialogue skip to talk to Lorelei right away. Sadly though, for my testing and new game runs, you just can't get there fast enough without, you know, a snow drift and stuff. Either way, we talk to Lorelei, and then save quarter dialogue. Alright, driving time. This segment isn't too bad, but there is one major part in this segment that you need to make sure we nail. And that is to make sure that Tyreen does not talk. Uh, if she ends up talking, then you have to wait for Lorelai's uh, future waypoint, and that's not going to be good. So, in order to cut Tyreen off, you guessed it, dialogue skip. We're going to drive on here and make our way over to the second Hover Wheels technical. Now, there is one to my right side right there, but it's not actually faster to go for that, because look at the waypoint. It doesn't say anything about getting the technical just yet, so we have to be a little bit more patient here. So in the meantime, we're going to hit the radio tower for the XP and to have Moxie start talking. Moxie is going to overlap Tyreen from talking, which means we get the Lorelei future waypoint faster. So I can go ahead and grab the Echo device and teleport back to my car. Yeah, if you missed it, I did place Clone right as I jumped down from the radio tower. And right there, you can see Lorelei is way up ahead. Um, normally, if Tyreen talks, she tends to be a lot further behind. So yeah, this waypoint is being pushed a lot faster by doing that. Now, some of you guys might be wondering, how did somebody figure all this stuff out? Uh, it's been a collective effort in the community for the uh, BL3 speedrunning. I did find a lot of the skips, but some of the skips were also found by Deceptics, Garwood, Atsu, and a lot of other cool people. It's basically just a big game of trial and error to see what's faster and what's not. You record a segment, open it up in editing, and see which one is faster, frame by frame. Anyways, we hit that future waypoint I was talking about earlier with Lorelai, so she's making her way to the door. In the meantime, we're going to do a cool teleport up to the car, which saves half a second in the uh, normal way, and grab this car for a little bit of XP while waiting on Lorelai. Funny thing in this game, cars have stats, and some say that they're faster than others, like Triple Booster is supposed to be the fastest. Turns out the Triple Booster Cyclone and the Default Cyclone are the exact same speed. So it's saying all that stuff about having extra boost, it's kind of a lie. Now, I prefer the default Cyclone because it does have better handling than the uh, Triple Booster. So that's going to be our main car for a later game. Right there, Lorelai opened the door and we're able to proceed forward. Waypoint says we got to talk to Lorelai, but that is a lower lie. So we can go ahead and skip through and actually avoid talking to her. 
Now, at this point, I was um, giving up on trying to avoid every single enemy bullet to keep my Vagabond up. It's just not realistic and takes hundreds of resets to get that. Yeah, we'll grab the door and save put to lock in that segment and proceed on to the next map. By the way, this is post-commentary and during the editing, so this is not, you know, done live during the segments. Uh, so right here is where we get our Infiltrator, and this specific vendor right here is level 10. The one up by Lorelei is level 12, so if we get a class mod over there, I couldn't use it until level 12. So by getting the Infiltrator at level 10 there, that means we can get our shield broken for that fleet all the time, and it's going to be pretty nice for the speedrun. Also, it did happen pretty fast, but that class mod does have really, really good stats. It gives us Supersonic Man, Violent Momentum, and some shock and damage and whatnot to translate speed and damage. Uh, we'll get the one shot on both these guys and then hit the save station and go for that save quid. Beautiful, beautiful. Next up, we're going to grab a Torg Quickie from the vendor, which is a very, very strong rocket launcher. And Torg weapons get more and more damage the more you stick up a target with the sticky mode. But normally for this launcher, it's going to be two shot reload, two shot reload. So you never really get a huge stick bonus. Now, normally if you stick a target and swap weapons, then the Torg stickies blow up. But thank goodness during the swap reloading glitch, they don't actually blow up. With that in mind, we can stick up the target with all of our ammo reserved for rocket launcher ammo and instantly kill pretty much everything. It's, um, it's pretty broken. That launcher is only for Captain Tron and Katagawa Ball for later on, so don't worry about it right now. Anyways, we're gonna drive on here with our Cyclone, the best vehicle in the game in my opinion. And along the way, we are gonna grab a little bit of XP, so we'll place our clone to get back to the car faster. Now we'll head up the stairs and grab the Claptrap for the level up and spec that point into even more Cold Boar. At this point, getting that Cold Boar is going to be nice because we are going to be fighting some uh, robots coming up. Uh, we'll do a little more parkour and grab the Radio Tower too. You know, I don't know why I call it a Radio Tower. It's not really a tower, but we just grabbed the radio thing. There you go. Anyways, teleport back to the car and we will proceed on to zero. So yeah, going back to that launcher talk, you can use like pistols or launchers or whatever you want to use towards shotguns too for the stickies. But the reason why we grab that quickie is because it has a 75% bonus damage uh, stick bonus. And that damage multiplies over and over when you stick up the target using the swap reload glitch. Um, if I really wanted to, I could use the Torg stickies the whole entire run and kill every boss using that. But again, I do want to keep the speed run interesting, so I'm not going to do that. I'm going to use some uh, other different techniques. Get a little more XP along the way, and then we'll uh, meet zero. You know, one thing I've always wondered is why are the cutscenes 30 FPS? That's always been really annoying. Anyway, so I talked to Zero, and then we're not going to wait for him. We're going to teleport through these bars using clone, hit the save, and go for that save quid. All right, now for some loader mobbing. And like I said before, we are specced in the cold boars, so we're going to have that bonus cryo damage on our fire shotgun. And that's going to ensure we get those nice one-shots on these dudes. Now, the spawn pattern for the robots are going to be random, so there's no way to really predict where they're going to spawn. So this segment was just reset over and over until you got good spawns and were just near the enemies when they spawned in. I did place clone just in case I had to teleport back and it turns out I did so we had that ready. And we'll go ahead and finish off that final kill there and that was actually decent time for that mobbing, it wasn't too bad. From here we'll take down the barrier engulfing this area and then we're gonna go for that save quit. So that save quit right there doesn't really save time but it does help me split my segments which is nice. And for this next bit of mobbing it is also random enemies and also random spawn locations. Uh, so what we're going to do is go ahead and go to the first mobbing area. This spawn is always going to happen. You'll get four enemies right here, so the kill speed on them doesn't really matter because it's tied to a uh, timer. From here, we'll place clone up top, and I actually reset multiple times to make sure I got spawns up there. It's way more convenient than the spawns happening on the other side of this whole entire area. From here, we'll teleport back to the top and finish off these guys, which means we're close to this spawn location. Get the one shot on the heavy, and then we'll finish off the final enemy behind the wall over here. From here, the door's just opening, and we can go ahead and proceed on to the save station. Uh, by save quitting here, we can get the Hollow Blade upgrade even sooner. Now we're going to load back in and grab the Hollow Blade and go for another save quit because Zero's not here yet. By save quitting, he will be in the desired location, so we can give him the Hollow Blade and proceed on. Now, because I did reset a lot to make sure we had good enemy spawns, we didn't get anything like Super Heavies or Super uh, Malawan Soldiers, whatever you call them. So that does put us a little bit behind on XP, which means we do need to do a few more challenges. So after buying ammo there, we're going to head to Gigamine, and along the way, we are going to grab the Triple Booster Cyclone. No, we're not going to be driving it, we're just grabbing it for the XP. We'll shoot the car to get the two things of water to come down to connect the electric line. And then from here, we'll shoot the third one and then use a clone teleport to get behind the barrier before it comes down. I think we need another drum roll for this uh, half second time save. <laughs> Yes, I did it because it looks cool, and I mean, time save is time save, right? You gotta go fast. From here, we'll scan the car at the closest uh, car station, and then we'll grab a regular Cyclone and proceed on to the Gigamine. 
The cyclone here is thin enough to get through this area and hit the save station and the waypoint. Save, quit. Alright, time for Gigamind. Really easy boss because we do have the TK's wave. Um, he spawns in the same location every time. He does the same pattern. So if you get right up in his face and go for the uh, crit on his back, he dies extremely fast. I think like three or four shots if I recall. Uh, one, two, three, four. Okay, five shots. Whatever. Still pretty good. Right there, we did get the brain to drop early. I did actually have to reset quite a few times to get that. Um, sometimes he will drop the brain right away or he'll drop it as his final drop. Ideally, you want to grab it ASAP. From here, a little bit more save quitting after hitting waypoint, and then we're going to unlock our class mod. Now, the cool thing here is we are just going to hit level 10, which means we can equip it right away. So, we're going to have all that bonus speed and bonus damage from the Infiltrator class mod. Um, right there at the main menu, we did start the Bounty of Blood add-on, because we are going to get the Bounty of Blood dialogue every time we spawn in. So, Zane is going to say, it's been a while since I did a spot of bounty hunting. It'll be good to get back in the game. And that dialogue can be used for dialogue skipping. You want that. Um, as for the inventory stuff, I did equip cannon, I did equip my new fleet shield, I did equip the infiltrator, and I put the point into more speed. Unlike my old Zane geared speedrun you might have seen on my channel, this time around we do have the mantis cannon. Yeah, back then in the geared run we didn't have cannon, it wasn't a thing yet, so this is actually going to help the run quite a bit. While waiting for unskippable animations and dialogue, I did change my name to Speedy Zane and put on a pretty cool customization. So at this point, we're going to wait for Maya to stop talking and check off the objective. In the meantime, we'll buy some shotgun ammo and go ahead and sell some garbage. And then we're going to be heading off to Athena's, which is going to be the most broken map by far. Yeah, a lot of crazy things happen in Athena's, and I can't wait to show this off. Anyways, cycling back to the Infiltrator, whenever we activate our action skill, our shield's going to break for that fleet. And you can see right there, that is our first uh, showing of the action skill cancel glitch. Normally, you might see people open their inventory to do the action skill cancel, but it is possible to do it without opening your inventory, but it's a little more complicated. Um, in order to do it, you gotta aim down sight, swap weapons, activate action skill, swap back. And that button combination is a little bit hard to hit. It'll take a lot of practice. So we set the travel for Athena's, did a clone teleport back, and off we go. At this point, all of my action skills are used up, so I gotta go ahead and go for a save point to refresh those. Alright, this is where mobbing gets a lot more complicated, because, like I said, we have no shield. So, I do have to get pretty lucky during the mobbing to make sure enemies aren't hitting me much, and that involves a lot of resets and is quite difficult. At the bottom of my bar there, you can see I do have three stacks of a Supersonic Man. Normally, you're only supposed to get two, but you can triple spam the cannon, like, instantly if you just, like, spam action skill. And for some odd reason, it gives you three stacks, so you get even more speed doing that. It's a nice little glitch. Uh, for the mobbing, it was just reset after reset until I got good spawns and wasn't going down into Fight for Your Life. And I'm not going to bother activating my action skill and fire unless my shield breaks, because I do want to have a little bit of shield here to kind of survive if I can. Plus, the enemies are all dying in one shot, and it's not really a big deal. From here, we'll hit the barrel into the cutscene, which doesn't do anything at all, but it does look kind of funny. And then we gotta wait for Maya to talk for a little bit. Uh, during that karma there, I did get frozen, but it doesn't really matter because we're just waiting for dialogue. So in the meantime, we're gonna do what we do best, and that is gonna be XP hunting. Luckily, along the way, there are the Typhon logs, which are very, very easy to get, so we are gonna be grabbing those. And the cool thing about Typhon logs is it gives you XP for finding all three, and you get another thing of XP for opening the Typhon chest. So it's gonna be an easy grab for XP when we get there. From here, we'll head up the stairs and hit the save station for the next area. And as soon as Tron says attention, we're gonna go for that save quid. Yeah, after he says attention, the waypoint kicks forward after a save quit. We'll jump off the cliff and teleport back for the adrenaline rush, and we'll wait a tiny bit longer for the dialogue. Hmm. Alright, anytime now. Attention. There's the attention, go for the safe wood. Now, the next mobbing segment was quite difficult, and I say that for every mobbing segment, but this one was by far the most difficult yet. These troopers with the Malawan shields block damage, and it's super annoying, so I had to make sure I got good shots off on them. And I also had to reset quite a bit to make sure we did not get too many heavies. No matter what, you are going to get like a few heavies, but I had to make sure I didn't get too many because they can be a pain to kill sometimes. Here's the big finale where you get a bunch of enemies in the middle of the map, so our goal is going to be to take them out as soon as they spawn in. Right there, we did get a bad Nog, but we did one-shot them, so that is nice for the bonus XP. Uh, by bonus XP, I mean, you know, they're worth more. Just a few more enemies to go, and I'm saving the guy up top for the final one because we're going to be doing an out-of-bounds. Yeah, I think this is our first, like, real out-of-bounds for the run. Like, that actually matters. So, if you have a little bit of speed, you can jump and parkour on this pole, jump on the roof, and mantle this invisible wall here and make your way out-of-bounds. And what this is going to do is allow you to hit the save and do a dialogue skip on Maya after ringing the bell. I gotta say, this invisible wall is huge, so it's really hard to get around it. 
We'll we'll fall down, hit the save, and Maya's just making her way to the door, so we're just waiting on that bell. Kind of a nightmare. Any second now, there it is. We'll go ring the bell and go for the save quit. And that's gonna skip, you know, waiting for the door to open and Maya talking and whatnot. Proceeding on here, we are gonna grab the claptrap because that is gonna be a little more XP, and we're gonna be doing another out of bounds. Normally, you have to mob this area before Maya runs through it, but we're gonna be avoiding all these enemies right here. So with a little bit of parkour, we're going to make our way up top here and get a little speed from our cannon. Get a mantle off the side of the rock there and do a C jump around the corner and barely, and I mean barely, clear that cliff. From here, we're going to run forward and hit the save station and go for another save quit. And what that's going to do is despawn all the enemies in the previous area and Maya's just going to run through gracefully and trigger the next waypoint. Um, while waiting for Maya to slowly run over, we're going to kill Chupacabra and get some XP. Uh, we did skip all of that mobbing in the previous area, so we are a little bit behind on the XP. We'll place clone and while waiting on Maya still, we're gonna go grab the Holy Spirit side mission because this side mission gives a ridiculous amount of XP, but we're gonna be doing that later on. We'll kill Chupacabra for the level up. Uh, legendary doesn't really matter, that's good money. We'll just pick that stuff up. And from here, this is gonna be our first photo mode through wall. So they actually patched this glitch, but there is a new way to do it. So if you run at something with speed and go into photo mode and push your camera forward, you can exit photo mode and ring the bell through the wall if you spam the interact button fast enough. And then we go for that save quit, spawn back at the uh, save station, and kick the waypoint forward. From here, we're going to do some clever parkour and make our way over to Ava. And after we talk to Ava, we're going to rush back and finish the Holy Spirit side mission. Uh, in the meantime, Ava's going to be talking and opening the gates while we're doing the mission, so we might as well be out hunting for XP while waiting. Now, I have found a way to get over that gate to the next area early, but it doesn't help at all because it won't trigger anything. Yeah, Ava has to physically be there for the next trigger to happen, so that's why we're doing the uh, Holy Spirits. Anyways, that did happen kind of fast. I did spec my skill point into more Cold Boar, so that's going to give us even more cryo damage and swap speed. While waiting for the Ratch Nest to go away there, you can get a snipe on the Broodmother, which doesn't help at all, but it looks kind of cool. From here, what we got to do is melee the 5 Ratch for the Livers, and if you don't do the optional Liver Collection part of this mission, then you're not going to get that massive amount of XP, so you got to make sure you do that. So right there, Ava just opened the gate and now she's waiting on us, but we do have to finish the last bit of this mission. So we'll get a snipe on the final ratch in the background, get the liver, activate the thing, and go through this uh, sewer thingy with the clone, whatever you want to call it. Get the final liver, get the snipe on the boss that did spawn early because we were so fast. And that guy did drop a legendary, but it was just a uh, tidal wave, believe it or not, not TK wave, the good one. That's just coincidence during that segment, we're not going to be using it, we're just going to sell it for money. Uh, believe it or not, that level, I guess, 11 or 12 tidal wave is still not stronger than our TK wave level 4. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Anyways, save quit to get back here, spec another point in the cold boar, and we're gonna proceed forward. Also, we did get a massive amount of XP2 to hit level 12. Onto the cemetery, this is just a bunch of mobbing, so the first spawn is gonna be right here. Pretty straightforward, you get one heavy and three of the normal dudes. Um, you have plenty of time to kill them, Ava's just taking her time to walk over to the tomb. And while waiting for her to open that door there, we're going to place clone and rush our way back to uh, Chupacabra. And we'll go ahead and grab one more kill real quick to get some bonus XP. Now, we do need to be pretty quick here because our clone duration is very, very short. You can see there it almost runs out and then we teleport back. Yeah, without the skill borrowed time, you really don't have much duration. And we're not going to have that skill for the whole run, so it's going to be a rush. Anyways, from here, we're going to go around the back side of the graves, because if you run to that right side the other way, uh, you're going to get a bunch of bonus spawns, and turns out they are not required. So because we never trigger those spawns to happen, Ava's going to run straight through and open the second door right away. Now, once she's working on the door, we're going to go ahead and trigger the spawns by walking into the right location, uh, because right now Ava's opening that door slowly, so we might as well get a little more XP if we can. Also, we did grab the Typhon Log at the top there, so we only have one more to get for this map. Now here, we're going to place Clone to get a little more distance forward after we get the uh, Ratch kills inside the grave. So we're going to run down, take them out, and teleport back. Now, right here is a completely RNG moment. You'll see when I run forward, we're going to have the uh, drop pod shoot down. Um, that is going to be random as far as I could tell, so I had to reset multiple times to make sure it happened right away. Now we'll take out the Ratch Nest and get the Iridium piece. Uh, because we did go so fast there, the dialogue is overlapping, allowing the piece to pop up early. Now we'll go for a save quit and that's going to put us back by the save station by the bridge. And also all the enemies in the cemetery are going to despawn, allowing Ava to run forward. But because we save quit, Ava's like, oh wait, where did you go? So we got to run by that rock right there and that's going to make you be close enough to the NPC to make them move. Remember, if you are too far away from NPCs, they're going to stop moving. Anyways, it happened quite fast. I did equip the Torg rocket launcher we got from earlier game. And I did a pretty cool clone teleport to skip the bridge door. Now Ava's slowly making her way over to the bridge door to open it for us. And that is a required objective so we're just waiting for that to be done 
In the meantime, we're gonna grab the radio challenge and get that XP and also keep ourselves closer to Ava to make sure she keeps moving. Uh, if I would have zipped through the whole area fast, she would have stopped moving. We'll grab the claptrap for a little more XP and you can see on the objective that Ava's gonna check off. That means she finally opened the door. And from here, there's gonna be a bunch of dialogue. So we're gonna barely hit the save station from this range by jumping off that crate and then go for the save quit to skip all that dialogue. All right, now for Tron, don't blink. It's gonna happen really fast. We're gonna use the Torg Sticky and the Swap Reload Glitch to stick him up a lot. So what we're going to do is take it right here on top of the uh, flower planter. I don't know what you want to call it. Uh, that's going to make sure his ice wall doesn't block me. And we're going to stick him up four times. And he's dead. <laughs> like imagine if I would have used all of my ammo reserve. It would have been enough to probably kill a level 25 enemy. It is quite ridiculous. Anyways, we did a double save quit there to skip over the dialogue for Maya to ask for the iridium. So we're going to hand over the iridium and wait for it to check off before we save quit. Yeah, that's one of those weird objectives. Like, normally you can hand him the thing and then you can save quit right away. But for some odd reason, the Iridium piece doesn't check off for a couple seconds. From here, we'll approach Maya and she's going to start walking towards the vault key. In the meantime, while waiting for her to slowly walk over, we're going to get the final Typhon log here. Clone teleport back to the beginning area and we're going to get the Typhon chest. Now, this is going to be a rush. Even with the speed I have, um, we only have a little bit of time to get the Typhon chest to make it back to Maya before she stops moving. Uh, because right here we are super far away from the NPC and that's almost going to stop them from moving. So what we're going to do here is Typhon is still technically talking. So we got to go ahead and play a random Typhon log out of my inventory. Uh, yeah, a lot of people probably don't know about that, but you have a log sheet on your uh, inventory. You can listen to previous logs. By playing a random Typhon log, it will skip the current Typhon log from playing, thus making me have all three and unlock the Typhon chest. From here, we are close enough to Maya again, so she's not going to stop moving. But we still got to move fast because she's at the Iridian structure now. If you're not standing near her after this dialogue, she's not going to move over to the vault key. So we'll slide along here and we make it back just in time. Yeah, it's quite the rush. At this point, I never really had much time to stop by a vendor and sell my garbage. So sadly, my inventory is full and I can't really pick up loot to sell more. It isn't really an issue though. We can do that once we get back to Sanctuary. From here, Maya has to move a little bit more forward and unlock the vault key. Then we'll head back to Sanctuary and prep for Skybo. Just a small bit of dialogue to go, and I couldn't find a way to skip this dialogue. Um, Typhon logs don't skip over other NPCs. Weirdly enough, Typhon logs only skip over Typhon. Alright, so we're going to go for a quick save quit to skip that blue warp tunnel because that wastes, you know, like two seconds or something. And now we're going to make our way over to Tannis and give it a vault key and then sell off a little bit of garbage. Stopping at the vendor does waste a tiny, tiny bit of time, but I have to clear out my inventory to make sure we can pick up the Nimble Jack when we get it. Yeah, we're going to be going for that shotgun pretty quick, and I got to make sure I don't have to open my inventory, drop an item, and pick it up. Because that would waste a little more time, and we definitely don't want that. Now, you can see my XP right now. We're just about level 13. In fact, we're going to hit it pretty quick here. And that means we're going to unlock the C and Red skill. If you're not familiar, if you have that skill and activate any action skill, well, it's going to activate all of your kill skills too. That means we're going to have our two stacks of violent speed and be running really, really fast. At this point, speed is going to pick up even more, so we're going to be going even faster. The Sanctuary segment is done, so we're going to be heading off to Skyball. Our goal right now is to actually head over to Reese first, and we got to talk to him a few times. And Reese has a lot of dialogue, and the only way to skip that is going to be the save quit. And the save quit's actually set back a little far back. But even then, save quitting and running all the way back is still faster than listening to all the dialogue. Dialogue in this game is very plentiful, and we're going to do everything in our power to skip over it. I mean, I know the dialogue, you know, pieces together the story and whatnot, but for a speedrun, it just, you know, slows you down. Anyways, you can see there I am shooting cannon into the air because we do have the scene red skill now. And now that we have that speed on demand, we can go ahead and get around faster. We'll skip the cutscene and go for the save quit because a bit of dialogue is going to play. And then from here, we're going to shoot cannon twice, get our two stacks of violent speed, and run back to Reese again. Now, earlier I did mention action skill canceling, and we're going to be doing that only if we don't have any cannon charges. Uh, if I need more speed, I can use my clone to action skill cancel. Like I said, the trick is pretty hard to do, and I do want to limit the amount of times I have to do it. I would hate to have a really smooth segment going along and then I try to action skill cancel and screw it up. If you screw it up, you're going to place clone and not actually action skill cancel, and then you waste a clone. From here, we're waiting for Reese to open the door, so we'll go ahead and build up some speed before the door opens, get that slide, and grab the corner of the door there. Cool thing about this game is you can grab the door from any part of the uh, the blue part, and all of the previous games you have to grab the door from the middle of it. So we're just drawing a straight line to the door, and we just grab whatever's closest to us. Alright, time for Skywell, and as you know, this is a low gravity map, so if you jump, you're gonna jump pretty high. Also right there, you can see we're out of cannon charges, so we're gonna be doing the action skill cancel using clone. Uh, you'll know when I do it because you'll see my gun kind of shuffle for a second. Like right there. 
and the shield breaks. You can see in the corner that the clone is grayed out, but we do have a full clone uh, ready. It's just a visual bug. Anyways, back to the low gravity thing. Um, rocket jumping is going to be a thing in this run. And you might think, you know, this map has a lot of cool rocket jumps or something, but it really doesn't. In fact, this whole map is pretty much just mobbing. Nothing really more to it. Now, there is going to be some clever parkour and skips and stuff in this map later on, but for the most part, just a bunch of mobbing. So it did take a lot of resets to get ideal mobbing. Uh, you saw right there a little bit earlier, I did clone warp back to the beginning area there to make sure we can get all the mobs. These spawn patterns are random, so you just have to make sure you get good RNG. By the way, for those who don't know, RNG means random number generator. Basically luck. A uh, nice little double kill there for the guys jumping down. Right here, we're going to place the Viper Drive, and then Reese is going to blabber away and then open the door. Luckily, though, close by is going to be a side mission, so we're going to grab that and use a dialogue skip to open the door faster. In order for it to work, though, you have to pick up this mission before it restarts his second set of dialogue, which is pretty hard. In fact, we barely got it right there, but you can see now that guy is talking instead of Reese. So the door there is going to open a lot earlier, and we can proceed on. We'll slide past the enemies in front of the door and go onto the elevator. Then we'll place that beautiful Viper Drive and go for a bunch of save quits. Yeah, coming up, Katagawa is going to talk a lot, so we're just going to save quit all that dialogue. Now, I never mentioned it earlier, but we did pick up the Bounty of Blood DLC mission, and that's making Zane say, did a spot of bounty hunting every time we spawn in. That dialogue only happens when you spawn in, so it's only going to skip other dialogue if it's right at the beginning there. So right there, the bounty dialogue did skip over Katagawa, but not all of him. And the reason why we don't jump into photo mode and extend that dialogue even longer is because we have to mob here anyways, and also we're going to be mobbing so fast that the door in this area is going to open early. Because Katagawa is going to be talking at the time when Ri should be talking, Katagawa is going to overlap Ri's and then uh, skip his dialogue. Yeah, it's hard to explain, but basically the game doesn't think you should be able to mob that fast, so the dialogue timing gets screwed up and you can proceed on faster. Now we'll jump into the vents and we're going to do a nice parkour skip coming up. I've shown this skip quite a few times in my playthroughs, so I'm pretty sure a lot of people are familiar with this one. Instead of going all the way around, mantle this rock and then jump over to this area. That easy. Alright, so now we do need to get a little bit of XP and there is a claptrap up ahead. And I gotta say, this parkour here is awful. To mantle the right side of the rock here is very, very precise, and I screwed that up so many times. If you don't grab the rock there, you will just fall all the way to the bottom, and that's not good. We'll buy a quick bit of ammo, and then we gotta head over to the valve. Now, if you slide off the side of the pipe there, you can get a lot more speed and clear that gap pretty easily. From here, we'll do a little bit of parkour up the side of the rock, and then wait for the valve. Reese is almost done here. Once it turns green, we'll go ahead and turn it, and then go for the save quit. Uh, that save quit's gonna open the door early, so we don't have to wait for the animations. Coming up here, there is gonna be a nice clone teleport that saves a little bit of time. So for this area, we're just gonna skip the mobs. They're not really required, and we're just gonna jump up to the top and activate the shoot. So we'll mantle off that rock, place clone, and teleport up, and hit the switch right away. You'll notice there I don't jump down right away, and that's because normally there's blades in there before you uh, turn off the switch. And even though the blades visually look like they're gone, you gotta wait a little bit longer, otherwise they will kill you still. So that's kind of why we pause right there. We'll place the Viper Drive and go for another save quit. Next up, we gotta find the three ball things. There's not a whole lot to it, you just look at them, click the button, and proceed on. And after this, we're gonna start XP farming, because we are very, very behind on XP. I didn't accidentally miss a bunch of XP I was supposed to get for this route. It's just gonna be a lot faster to farm Handsome Jackie for the XP I need. Handsome Jackie is gonna be a lot faster than doing random side missions and killing random enemies along the way, so we're just gonna efficiently XP farm there. I placed the Viper Drive into the respawn, and now we just gotta wait for it to check off. Shouldn't be a whole lot longer. Yep, there it is. Go for the save quit. And that's gonna kick respawn forward and open the door right away. On to the Handsome Jackie farm, and I wanna point out, Handsome Jackie is level 17. Our shotgun is level 4. You know what that means? We're still gonna get a one-shot because the TK wave is OP. So we're gonna rush at her to get the most out of Vinyl Momentum, go for the one-shot, and pick up our Nimble Jack. Now, the Nimble Jack drops at level 17, so that's going to be my replacement for later on. And I want to make sure I'm level 17 to equip that shotgun once we get to Rampager. So, that means we're going to farm Handsome Jackie until 15 and a half. There we go, we hit level 14, so only a level and a half to go. We'll spawn back in and speed spec our skill into even more Violent Momentum. Now, Violent Momentum is a very strong skill for being a tier 1 skill. So, Violent Momentum is the faster you are moving when your bullet lands, the more damage you get out of it. We're already speedy speedy, so our shots are going to hit really hard when they land. That is also why you see me rushing towards Handsome Jackie before I get the shot off. That's going to make sure we get the most out of Vinyl Momentum. What's funny is this is also another tier 1 skill that is super duper OP. 
In fact, it can deliver over a thousand percent bonus gun damage just by moving fast. Now, we're not moving that fast yet. We don't have a snow drift and all that kind of stuff yet, but we're still getting a crap ton of gun damage out of it. On top of that, we have the TK's wave. We have, you know, cold bore for 200% more cryo damage. We have action skill and fire. It all adds up. Man, I gotta say, it's satisfying getting those one shots and immediately going for the save quit. From here, it's gonna be rinse and repeat until we hit 15 and a half. Or actually, no. Oh my goodness, I didn't do the math, did I? 14 and a half, not 15. Sorry, I recorded this segment months ago, so I kind of forgot. Basically, once we get to Rampager, we're going to just be hitting level 17, so we'll unlock the shotgun then. The Nimble Jack. From here, we'll do a bunch of mobbing, and I remember this part. This mobbing was very difficult. Remember, I don't have any shield, HP, healing, anything like that. So my HP is just ticking down, and luckily right there, we got a second win once the bullets landed. So I didn't really waste any time doing that. We got a nice little double kill there, and then the guy at the bottom, I remember this guy gave me a little bit of trouble. Yeah, but for the most part, it was still pretty fast, and overall my fastest segment. We'll grab the Claptrap for a little more XP, and then we'll proceed on to the Respawn. Claptrap is talking right here, so I think a dialogue skip does happen over Respawn right there. But I'm not 100% sure if that door opens after dialogue, or if it's animation based. Anyways, go for the save quit to kick freeze ball forward, and then we will proceed on here. Alright, so we do have to hit a couple invisible waypoints, so we're gonna touch the door there. There's an invisible waypoint right there. And that's gonna cause freeze ball to be like, hey, you gotta go to the servers and destroy the stuff. Luckily, there's a really cool clone teleport here. There's a small gap in this door. You can place clone and get into the room a lot earlier. Now, we gotta wait a second before we destroy the barrels, because if we do it too early, the server's gonna not break and break the mission. If that happens, the mission locks up, and you gotta save quick to respawn the barrels and fix it. We'll slide into the waypoint there, skip the dialogue by save quitting, and jump back in. And then from here is just gonna be a bunch of mobbing. While waiting for the elevator to go down, we're gonna quickly buy some ammo and sell off some garbage. And I wanna make sure I start the stuff I wanna keep, because I can accidentally sell something during the run, and I definitely don't want that to happen. Like, imagine if I accidentally sold my Nimble Jack, and then I realized that 50 segments later. That would be really bad. We'll get a one-shot on an enemy 14 levels over my shotgun, and then we'll take out the lesser enemies on the side. Now, the troopers are some of the worst enemies in the game. They move around a lot. Uh, they're kind of like marauders from Borderlands 2. They just never stay still, so they're pretty painful to hit sometimes. Uh, there's level 15, put another point into Vital Momentum. Then we'll go for the save quit to skip even more dialogue. We only have one more required mobbing segment for this map, so we'll speed our way back to the arena. Now, you'll notice when we fall down a long ways, I do the slam, and then we instantly, like, go back to running. Uh, you don't see, like, your melee go into the floor, and then you recover from the animation. That is a small glitch called slam canceling. Now, on PC, we do have the uh, arrow keys, and if you click any arrow key, you're going to activate an emote. By doing any emote as soon as you hit the floor from a slam, uh, it will cancel the animation and go straight into the emote, but you can run forward and cancel that emote from happening. So if you mash that really fast, it just cancels the slam entirely. Anyways, we defeated the mobs, so we're gonna click the button and blow up the party spaceship. That animation does take quite a bit, so safe quitting is gonna be a lot faster. Then we're gonna take on the Katagawa Ball. Remember earlier we got that level 12 Torque Sticky Launcher? Well, what happened to Captain Tron is gonna happen to Katagawa Ball too. So we'll skip the cutscene, slide forward, and proceed on to the elevator. Then while falling down the elevator shaft, we're gonna swap to Sticky Mode and then wait for Katagawa Ball. We gotta make sure he goes red phase right away, which took a lot of resets to make sure he goes for that charge. And then from there, he's gonna be still, and we can go for a lot of sticks and instantly kill him. From there, we grab the vault key, and we're back to Sanctuary. Now, you'll notice right here, I don't say quit right away to skip the blue warp tunnel. Uh, every now and then, you'll get these weird objectives that say return to Sanctuary, and those don't trigger for a little bit. So you gotta wait it out and make sure it checks off before you go for that save quit. If you don't wait, the mission breaks, and you have to save quit a second time, which does waste time. We don't want that. So we give Tannis the vault key, and then we're gonna race our way back to the bridge, talk to Lilith, and go for another save quit. At this point, we're coming up on Atlas HQ, and we just have to listen to a lot of dialogue right here. There's nothing you can do about it. Uh, you can't dialogue skip it, you can't save quit it, you just have to wait. So in the meantime, we're gonna do a little bit of shopping and grab ourselves a one shatter shield, triple amp shield. Yeah, um, that's gonna be for Katagawa Jr. Katagawa Jr. has a lot, and I mean a lot of HP, and it's really hard to one shot. We'll go to the slots and roll ourselves a snow drip for later on. So we get the triple vault symbol thing. And we get a snow drip victory rush. Minimum level for artifacts in this game is 27. They cannot be any lower. Finally, we need our weapon for Katagawa Jr., which is going to be the Ruby's Wrath. Not only is it one of the highest single shot launchers in the game, it will also be used for rocket jumping later on. 
Like I mentioned before, this is a theoretical speed run. Things that could happen, but not likely. So the mod did simulate insane RNG getting a one shot shield, snow drift, and a Ruby's Wrath in the same run. Reese is almost done blabbering away, so we're just gonna wait a little bit longer. And once he is done talking and the objective does check off, we're gonna head over to Meridian Metroplex and make our way to Atlas HQ. You can see there with my cursor I am spamming click because I know exactly where the maps are located. Uh, the maps never change position, so it's gonna be in that same location every time from new game. If you memorize where they are, you can just spam it ahead of time. Been a while since I did a spot of bounty hunting. Dude, every freaking time I do a segment, I gotta hear that same voice line over and over. Worth it for the time saves. Anyways, we're off to Atlas HQ now. So we grabbed a cyclone and we're gonna be zooming off to that location. Now this is gonna be your shortest path to get over there. And what's really cool is you can take the cyclone through a small gap up ahead. And that means you can drive all the way to the front door of Atlas HQ. We'll just zoom along here and skip all the enemies along the way. And to be fair, the enemies are super underleveled and not worth our time. Yeah, we slide through that gap and we're just gonna drive our way there. Sadly though, Atlas HQ cannot have cars in it, so that means that we do have to hop out before we travel to the next map. If you try to travel while you're still in the car, it's gonna say, you can't do that. We'll hop forward, hit the invisible waypoint, and then go for a save quit. And that means when we load back in, the door is gonna be open and we can proceed on. Yeah, the save quit skips over the Atlas soldier opening the door slowly. From here, we are gonna race waypoint to waypoint and skip all the mobbing in between. None of the mobs here are gonna be required, but we do need to make sure that we hit level 16 before taking on Katagawa Jr. To achieve that, we're gonna do a couple challenges on this map, such as the Claptrap and the Radio Tower thingy. But at the moment, all we can do is race to the map with speed. Since we are running a long distance, I did do a couple of action skill cancels. Now we'll keep up our stacks of violent speed. From here, we have to wait for the Nohound to pop out and go for the kill. Then we're gonna press the button and proceed forward. From here, I do have to be a little bit careful because enemies are now gonna have guns, and if they shoot me with any damage over time, I'm gonna die because I have no shield. I know I mentioned that quite a bit, but the enemies can really mess you up. Alright, so we'll head inside the headquarters and immediately go for that claptrap. I do want to point out these challenges aren't only for XP, they also give you Iridium 2, and that allowed me to buy my one shot of shield earlier from the crazy old vendor. At this point though, we're done with the crazy old vendor, so we only care about the XP. From here, we're going to hop down and take on the Arbalist, and this guy is a required kill. After you kill this guy, the door is going to open, and you can uh, avoid the other enemies in this area. In the next room, we do have two Null Hounds, and these guys are required for the objective. We'll go ahead and take them out pretty fast, click the button, and go for the save quit to avoid waiting for the door to open. This next area is quite interesting. It is going to be required mobbing, but you only have to kill certain mobs in this area. All that is required to clear out the area is to kill three of these drop pod sets of enemies, kill the one Malawan trooper that is dropped off by the dropship, and kill the six death spears too. After that, you're gonna get the two Arbalist guys in the back, and then after you kill them, you are good to go. You saw there, we did jump down and get the radio challenge done, and we used a clone teleport to get back up top to take out the mobs. Now, we just took care of the three pods that were required, so we're taking out the death spears, and using the Ruby's Wrath here is very nice because you don't really have to aim too much. Behind me is going to be the one dropship guy that I was talking about, so we took him out. That triggers the two Arbalist or Hoplites in the back. We'll take them out and inspect my skill point even more by the momentum, and then go for that save quit. That's going to put us right back at the elevator where we need to be. Now, the elevator does take you a little bit of time to come down, and by save quitting, it also makes it come down a lot faster. Funny thing here is we're going to enter the elevator, click the button, and immediately go for a save quit. And the reason for that is, when we jump back in, it's gonna think we already listened to Katagawa's uh, elevator dialogue. They slow down the elevator so Katagawa can do all of his dialogue before he reach the top. So because we save quit his dialogue there, it's not gonna play now, and that means the elevator is gonna go a lot faster up. Also, I think the reason for that is because when you come back to farm Katagawa Jr. for a casual playthrough, they speed up the elevator the second time and beyond whenever you want to ride it back up. Even with it being even faster without dialogue, it still feels pretty slow, and we have nothing to do except for wait. While waiting, we'll just do some random emotes and just burn the time. You'll notice too, in the last mobbing segment, we just hit level 16, so we're just on level for this fight. So the elevator door is going to open up and we're going to speed our way to the waypoint. And after we activate the secret switch on the desk, we're going to save quit to skip the animation of the drop down opening. So we'll hit that and save quit. Alright, now for Katagawa, like I said before, this guy is extremely healthy. So we are going to put on our one shatter shield and take off our infiltrator. And the reason why we take off the infiltrator is because if I activate my action skill, I do not want my one shatter shield to break. I will lose the amp bonus. So we're going to build up a bunch of speed and run at him with the Ruby's Wrath and one shatter shield. And we're going to end up getting a pretty fast two shot on him. Not a one shot, sadly, but two shots still pretty good. At this point, we're going to place the clone right through the crack of the door to get in there a little bit faster once the boss is dead. 
The reason why we can't teleport in there right now to hit the next waypoint is because when you have a boss bar on the top of your screen, uh, if you try to clone teleport, it's going to send the clone back to you, like put the clone right in front of you. It won't actually teleport you to the clone's location. So immediately at the moment, Katagawa's bar disappears, we teleport towards the waypoint. We did speed equip our normal setup, so we have our fleet shield and infiltrator back on again. And at this point, we tell Reese to shave the stash, but it doesn't really matter which one you choose. Also, I do want to point out we recently went over the one hour mark in the run. You can see there in the corner. And I'm not trying to speed flex or anything, but finishing Atlas HQ in just over an hour is insanely fast. Anyways, we'll drop down and get the vault key, and then we're going to be heading back to Sanctuary. Everybody's favorite map. Sanctuary is going to be the same old, same old. We get a vault key, we take it to Sanctuary, and give it to Tannis. That's pretty much it. There's nothing to it. After Sanctuary, though, we are going to be heading over to Neon Arterial. And along the way, we're going to be doing something a little bit special. I don't want to spoil it, so I will go ahead and explain it once we get to that point. From now, Tannis does have the vault key, and we're going to head to the bridge. And funny enough, that arms race dialogue in the corner was not random. I did reset over and over until it triggered. And that dialogue did skip over Tannis' final line of dialogue, allowing us to talk to Lilith a lot faster. Anyways, off to Meridian Metroplex. Uh, we're going to take a small detour here for a reason. Normally, we're supposed to head to the Neon Arterial Door and mob a few enemies. But instead, we're going to be taking a sharp left and heading to a different area. We're going to be farming for, or I guess first trying because segmented, a Grease Trap. Yeah, so we're going to hit the save there and go for a save quit and activate the Cartel's event instead of the Broken Hearts. And in this very location, after a bunch of resets, uh, I was able to get Roaster to spawn. And Roaster can drop the Grease Trap if you're lucky. Now, the issue is, some Cartel bosses can only spawn in certain maps. The only place we can spawn Roaster right now is this area right here, which happened to be along the way. So luckily, we can grab that Grease Trap and get out of here. Now, there was a little bit of a fail there trying to pick up the Grease Trap, but I did not want to spawn another Roaster. No joke, it took over 100 resets to spawn that specific boss and get that specific drop. So that segment was perfectly fine in my opinion. You might be questioning, what is the point of the Grease Trap? Well, I will show that once we get there, which is going to be pretty soon here. Anyways, back on our journey to Neon Arterial. We have to mob these few enemies here, which wasn't too bad. There wasn't too many of them. Then we can stand about right here, and Zero's going to spawn right in front of us. At this point, I'm spamming the interact button, so when he pops up, I will talk to him right away. After talking to Zero, you can save quit to have that barrier immediately go down. But we recently found out, or I guess this would have been like months ago, that um, you can take a normal cyclone to the next area and speed along and not wait for Maya. Basically, for the next map, instead of waiting for Maya to talk and then Ellie to spawn the double D car, you can speed along and make your way to the next waypoint a lot sooner. There is a car station to my right in this area, but it's not active until all the dialogue's passed. Because we brought that cyclone to the next map, we already have a car. Also right there, I did do a very, very small derp. I opened the fast travel. Um, out of all my segments, this one was the fastest, so I did keep it. Interesting glitch there. You might have noticed the car had the boost just like infinitely going. That is a visual bug. It's not giving you like infinite boost. But I guess if you boost through a travel point and then get in the next map, it will have that uh, visual animation. So yeah, you can see that Maya is kind of blabbering away and we're waiting for the double D car. And instead of being way back there and waiting for the car, we're way up here. A bit further ahead though, we do need the double D car. Luckily though, there is a car station up ahead so we can just grab it up there. Also, the double D car is very slow, so the cyclone's going to be a lot faster to get up to the next waypoint. What we're going to do is boost forward, save quit, and the save station trigger right there is massive. Even though we weren't even near it, we still hit it. We'll go back to the Broken Hearts event and jump back in. And also, save quitting does despawn all the enemies that were chasing you to this area. If they were still chasing me, then they could easily kill my car and ruin the segment. Just like the Biorig car from the Droughts, it does take a little bit of time for this car to spawn in. So after we drive forward, we're going to park in a decent location and put Clone right next to the driver's seat. And we're going to one shot the cars with our TK's wave way faster than killing them with the car, by the way. Once we kill the fifth one, we know that's the final one that we need for this area. We can teleport back to our clone and jump right in the driver's seat. Very, very clean. Also, you can see there the car gets down to 11 HP from the rockets. Yeah, normally in a single segment speedrun, you kind of want to take those guys out to make sure they don't destroy your car. But for segmented, we could just, you know, risk it for the biscuit. We were lined up right on top of the waypoint as soon as it popped up. Maya destroyed the door, and as soon as we can move again, we will uh, boost right away. At this point, it's just another driving map. Not really one of my favorite kind of things to do in the Borderlands series. I don't know, car segments have just never been fun for me. Maybe that's just me. Now, because I do want to get perfect mobbing up ahead, I do want to split the segment, so what we're going to do is hit the save station in this next car area, and then we're going to go for a save quit and make sure we can perfect the next mobbing segment. 
The next part here isn't too bad, it's just like the first mobbing location. In fact, it's a little bit easier because the rocket turrets are in uh, better locations. So we spawn another double D car and we're going to go ahead and drive forward. And just like before, we're going to park our car in a good spot and head over to the enemy car garage. It's just going to be another game of whack-a-mole. We wait for them to spawn and we take them out with our TK wave. Now, I did take out that turret because I do want to center my car with the waypoint up ahead. Also, I wanted Maya there to shoot the fireball to destroy the first car, so I'm ready for the second one. And then from here, it's rinse and repeat, kill the five cars, and then we're going to clone teleport back to the driver's seat. There's number five. Teleport back, and you can see here we are lined up with the waypoint. Now, I would have loved to find a way to get the car to be on top of the waypoint and then teleport back, but there just isn't enough time because the car spawns kind of drive away and you got to chase them down. We don't want that. Now from here, we're going to drive past the waypoint, hit the save station right in front of us to make sure we can spawn there when we save quit. Then we're going to back up, park the car, and save quit the jump out of the car animation. Also, this is going to skip Maya's dialogue before she starts running and puts her in a better spot too. Okay, so now we're going to proceed on, and none of the mobs here are required, so we can skip over them. I do want to make sure we hit level 17 for our nimble jack by the end of this map, so we are going to be doing the Typhon logs and also the claptrap and the Typhon chest. Maya does take her time to break down this barrier, so we're going to use the clone to teleport through. But the issue is, you got to stand by that barrier as soon as Maya breaks it down. Otherwise, the game will not register that waypoint, and you will break the mission. So, what we're going to do is hit the save station up ahead, teleport back, hit the waypoint, and then teleport back again. Now, the reason why we had to teleport back again is because there is a save station right by that barrier that we broke down. So, we got to make sure we hit that save station one more time to spawn right there. Just like on Athena, we are going to use the Funimo glitch again. This time though, we're going to grab the Claptrap under the train instead of waiting for the train to go by. At this point, we are just about level 17 and the Typhon challenges are going to get us there. Now, I do want to go for another save quit here because I do want to refresh my action skills. And then we can jump back in and hit level 17. Along the way here, I am going to be killing a few Guardians because I do need to hit level 21 on Eden 6 at a specific time. Like I said guys, this XP route is very, very specific and the bare minimum. So now we're going to place Clone, grab the final Typhon Log, and we're going to use a Typhon Log to skip Typhon again. That will give us level 17, spec into Vital Momentum, and put on our Grease Trap and our Nimble Jack. Yeah, it does happen pretty fast. So we teleport back to our Clone, and now we're going to hit the Typhon Stash. The items in the stash don't matter at all, we only care about the XP. Now, not super duper long ago, the Nimblejack did get a pretty big buff. Not only is the one we have 50 damage times 12, but it also has a 100% crit damage too. That means if we do crit an enemy, the bullets are going to ricochet, and we're going to kill two targets for the cost of one shot. Yeah, it's pretty nice, and the TK's wave wasn't really a great gun for ricocheting shots. Anyways, it is time for Rampager, and Rampager is going to be such an easy boss because, well, we farmed the Grease Trap. The Grease Trap has a really cool glitch with this boss, and we're going to be abusing that. Um, as you know, Rampager has over a minute, a full freaking minute of immune phase where you're standing there and doing nothing. Well, for some odd reason, for this boss, Tyrion and Troy, the Grease Trap's secondary firing mode can bypass immune phases. Yeah, so by going out of our way to get this Grease Trap, it is going to save us a bunch of time killing Rampager. Rampager is going to spawn in, we're going to fall down and try to get the most out of Vital Momentum and get the one-shot crit on his mouth. From this point, we're going to use the Swap Reload glitch and let the Grease Trap do all the work. It is quite odd too because the secondary firing mode does uh, no element damage, but for whatever reason, he's taking a no element damage damage over time. Yeah, that should not be possible, but I don't know, this gun just does that for some odd reason. Just a couple more magazines to go, and then we can go for that save quit and have the vault ready. There we go, he died, and we can go for the save quit. Now we're going to jump back in and rush our way over to the vault. And fun fact about this vault, if you place your clone anywhere in the vault and just simply teleport, the mission will break. Why? I don't know. It is quite interesting. We're approaching the vault, and we're going to go ahead and enter. And funny thing here is, if you go into photo mode, you can see that your character is already in the vault uh, during that blue warp animation. This doesn't do anything, by the way. It's just kind of a visual thing. Your character cannot move at that point until he's fully rendered in. But that is also quite interesting. Anyways, we got the piece, so we're just going to collect stuff to sell for money and get a little bit of iridium here. Then the waypoint's going to pop up, and we'll give it three punches to activate the load star. After that, we can just go for a save quit and make our way to the beginning of the map. It is a little bit faster to run back from the beginning of the map to Maya and Ava, rather than turning around and running out the vault and watching that blue warp tunnel. We'll go ahead and waste all of our action skills to get all of the speed we can at this point. And what we want to do here is not be right in front of Ava as soon as we hit the trigger for the cutscene, because after you skip a cutscene, you only have a small window to talk to an NPC before they go idle. In this case, Ava would fall over and, you know, be sat on the floor and then stand back up, and then you can talk to her. 
But because we were fast enough, you can talk to her right away as soon as the cutscene ends and make that segment a lot faster. From here, we gotta meet up with the rest of the team and tell them that Troy turned Maya into a book. But sadly, nobody on Sanctuary likes reading, so they didn't hold a funeral at all. Alright guys, we are officially at the halfway point in the speedrun. I mean, maybe not perfectly in terms of time, but the halfway point in the game is actually Eden 6, and that's where we're going to be heading next. I am aware that a lot of people don't really care for the Eden 6 part of the run, but I can assure you it's one of the most fun for speedrunning because there are so many fun glitches you can do, but I don't want to spoil them yet, so we'll get there when we get there. I'll just say now it is going to be quite the visual experience. From here, we're going to upgrade our SDUs for SMGs and backpack. Funny story, I was going to use the crit SMG later on for the run, Later on, I did decide to do a different strat, so we never actually used the crit SMG. I guess we bought the SMG SDU for no reason, but it's not a big deal because we have plenty of money at this point. Right now, Wainwright's talking away, and this is going to be an animation-based thing, so there's no way we can skip it. It won't matter if you overlap dialogue or even if you go for a save quit. However, we are going to be doing a dialogue skip here to skip over Lilith, telling you to travel to Eden 6. So we'll pick up a random mission, and then Ava's going to talk over Lilith, and that's going to save two full seconds to travel to Eden 6. You can see there we did place clone at Ava's room, we're gonna run forward, and the option to travel to Eden 6 pops up two seconds sooner. We'll clone teleport back and do an out of bounds in Ava's room, and this is gonna get us to the drop pod a lot faster. We're gonna slide here and get under the ceiling, and then we can grab the door from up here. There we go, it popped up, and off to Eden 6. Right off the bat, we're gonna go for a save quit and refresh our action skills. After that, we are going to be darting over to the XP challenges. At this point, we are very underleveled on Eden 6, so we got to make sure we keep up on the XP. We'll do a slam cancel to get to the car faster and also hit the save station by that area. And then from here, we're going to race our way over to the radio challenge. Luckily, there is a nice shortcut to get this radio challenge done faster. We'll hop out and place our climb by a car and then go for the mantle. And instead of going all the way to the back side of this tower, you can just mantle off this generator and get right up. That will complete the challenge, and we can teleport back to our car. Then from here, we are going to complete the car challenge too. Luckily for this one too, there is a nice shortcut. So we're going to boost up this rock and hop out and get on top of it. And then you can easily just jump over and grab the car right away. From here, there's going to be two car stations that are very, very close to each other. But we're going to be going for the one that's slightly further away because there's no safe station at this area. The other car station has a safe station which would ruin our teleport back. There's our level up. We'll go ahead and max out Violent Momentum and go for the save quit. From here, we're going to spawn back at that safe station where we got the car in the first place, which is going to be a lot faster of a path over to Wainwright. So there's not going to be a whole lot we can do at this point except drive straight lines over to Wainwright. Just like any racing game, you want to take tight turns and also not do too much zigzagging. At this point, you can see that my game is running a little bit slow because I have done a bunch of safe quits. And like I mentioned before, this game does seem to have a memory leak, so the game runs slower and slower the more you safe quit. We'll go ahead and ignore those enemies and boost forward and place our car in a good spot because we're going to be coming back to it. From here, we'll do a little bit of mantling and just slide along. Not a whole lot to it. There are a couple guys right here that are not required, but you can see here we just killed that guy with a level 3 vanquisher. He was a level 18. Yeah, that's same for you. Anyways, small skip here. You can go over the rocks and make your way into the area faster. From here, we do have to kill the five enemies outside his house. And I do miss a couple shots on that first guy, but then right after I destroy everything else. Like I mentioned before, you only have a small window after skipping a cutscene to talk to an NPC before they go idle. So we did quick talk to Wainwright and we placed our clone inside the house. And now the clone's gonna be by our vehicle while we're waiting for the waypoint to pop up. We hit the waypoint which was entering the house and now we're back at our car. From here, we're gonna do a nice skip to get over to the anvil a lot faster. But we do have to hit an invisible waypoint along the way. We'll drive by this tree trunk and we're gonna actually boost up the side of it which is gonna be a nice little skip. No skip, dude. There you go, you get one. And we'll drive through the invisible waypoint, which is going to be right there. Then from here, we do have to go for a safe quit in order to skip the mission forward. Alright, so now we're going to be on our way over to the anvil. And I gotta say, the anvil is a terrible place. No speedrunner wants to be here. I will say that right now. Um, this is going to be our first encounter with the car door enemies. If you're not familiar, these enemies hold a car door as a shield. And that's going to block all damage. So from range, they're going to be pretty much invincible unless I get point blank in their face. Anyways, enough complaining, we are going to be doing a couple challenges here too. So we are going to knock out the Typhon Logs, Typhon Chest, and the Claptrap Challenge. Let's go ahead and click the button and meet up with Brick. Now, outside of another NPC we're going to be encountering later on, Brick might be the second worst. Don't get me wrong, I love this guy, but yeah, you cannot talk to him if there's combat nearby. We're speedrunning, which means we're going to be skipping the unrequired combat. So when the objective says talk to Brick, you got to pray that he talks to you back. That did cause a lot of resets for this segment. 
Anyways, back to the mobbing. We're gonna have two waves of mobbing here, so we'll take out the final guy, and now we're gonna get a little bit of dialogue. At this point, there's not a whole lot we can do except wait for the new enemies to spawn. I go ahead and preemptively watch this door here, but for the first time ever, no enemies spawned there. It was kind of crazy. Every other failed segment I had for this area did have enemies spawn there, but yeah, unlucky, I guess. Anyways, not a big deal because the enemies were grouping together, and so I can get those nice ricochet kills. And at this point, you can see on the minimap that Brick finally made his way up here, so that is good news. We'll go ahead and kill off the final two enemies here, so that guy in the back and the guy on my left side. And then I pray to the RNG gods that Brick talks to me and doesn't jump down to the enemies. So a good thing to do here is block him from moving, and then maybe, maybe he'll talk to you. With this being segmented, obviously we got the luck that we needed, and we went for the safe win. Next up here, we do need to get the Typhon Log number 2. Now is going to be a perfect time to grab it, because Brick is slowly making his way over to the door to open it for us. So by the time we get the Typhon Log and make our way to the door, the door is going to be open. We'll run along here, and there's no rush to get to the door really, really fast, because we're still waiting on Brick. So you can see as soon as I get up here, the door is just going to open, which is perfect timing. From here, we're going to do a clone teleport through these bars, and that allows us to get this Claptrap a little bit faster for some XP. At this point, Brick needs you to hold his hand, so you gotta be near him for just a second, and then he will think about running forward and helping you with the mobbing. This is just a bunch of mobbing that is required, so our goal is to beat it as fast as possible. So ideally, you want to get those crits to get the ricochets to kill multiple enemies. You can see right there, there's Story Guy. Yeah, these guys are not fun with their unbreakable shields, and I had to reset many, many times to make sure I didn't get too many of them. Ideally, you want to get no car door guys, but I didn't want to reset hundreds of times, so this segment turned out pretty good, and we went with it. Only one more person left, we'll get the kill and then go for that save quit. By save quitting there, it's going to put Brick immediately by the door and opening it right away, so that will save us a little more time. He does take a second to open the door, so there's no like super rush to get over there right away. But there we go, he's going to slowly open the door and then we will proceed forward. Now this next area is one of the most difficult mobbing parts to do really really fast, and that is because enemies are random, spawns are randoms, and there's multiple levels. You have a first floor and a second floor. Not only that, but the room is pretty big, and you don't get the Jacob's Ricochets because nobody's nearby. Uh, basically, you just have to hope that things work out. Right there, we did get some pretty tough enemies, but we were able to one-shot them and get all that bonus XP. We did not waste any time, and it helps me stay on level with the XP. For the last couple weak enemies here, we did get some nice crits, and luckily there were some enemies nearby to get those chains. Right here are going to be the two final spawns, so we'll kill her off and clone teleport back, and then we'll finish off this guy in the leftover for the completion. From there, we're going to save put to get Brick by the door right away. And then we'll run over as fast as we can and have him open the door. We're pretty close from meeting up with Tina, so we're just going to proceed forward here. And this mantle right here, it doesn't look hard, but for some odd reason, I had to do that segment like 30 times. I just could not get it right. I kept bumping the wall or not mantling and stuff like that. Uh, that emote in the corner didn't do anything. Don't worry about it. It was a silly idea I had earlier, but I was thinking that maybe if I emote, uh, my body goes through the wall a little bit and maybe hits the save station. It never worked, but I felt like for the segment while waiting, we might as well just do something stupid. From here, we're going to take a small amount of time to wait for a second and then slide. Because for some reason, the waypoint doesn't pop up right away, and if you go too fast, you will uh, skip over it. From here, we'll skip the cutscene and quickly talk to Tina before she goes idle. And then, you guessed it, we go for that save win. Now it's time to collect the pizza toppings for the bomb. And also along the way, we're going to get the third Typhon log. Now, this is a very long Typhon log, so we do have to open our inventory and play another log to skip over it. If I don't do that and save quit too soon, we're not going to get the third Typhon log to check off. And that means we don't get the Typhon stash for a lot of XP. There we go, the Typhon log is complete, and we can proceed forward skipping all these save stations. Uh, we want to make sure when we save quit, we spawn back by Tina. We'll go through the vents, and we're going to collect another piece right here. And this clone placement right here is very precise. I want to get it outside the bars there, so that I can click the button. And then I can teleport back out and avoid waiting for the door to open. From here, we can go down and open all three boxes. No matter what, the topping's going to be in the final box you open, so you have to open all three. We got the pizza sauce, so let's go for the safe one. From here, we do have to give Tina all the toppings, and then she's going to make the bomb for us to open the door. But her animations are slow, so we're going to go ahead and safe quit over those two. At this point, we can grab the pizza bomb and then go grab the Typhon stash real fast. So we'll run out here, place clone, and jump down before we do. We get that level up for Violent Violence, and then we can teleport back out. Now, Violent Violence, you might be thinking, what's the point of that if you're using shotguns? Well, shotguns still have a pretty slow fire rate listed on the card, and we're going to be swap reloading super fast later game. And that means we can fire shotguns like a machine gun. Obviously, for mobbing, it's going to be complete overkill, but for bossing, it's going to be real nice. Alright, time for the worst mobbing segment of this whole entire speedrun. The whole thing. Everything in the story. The usual, enemies are random, spawn locations random, car door guys suck, 
I still don't have healing, so it's pretty easy to die. And there is a lot. And I mean a lot of enemies to kill here. On top of that, we do have to do the radio challenge right after, which is risky parkour. We're going to have a lot of speed after getting all those kills, so it's going to be pretty easy to fly off and, you know, fall into the void. Look at this. One car door guy, two car door guys, and a third car door guy right there. You might be asking, why not save quit and go for another try at that segment? One, they weren't too bad right there, and also, there's a lot of other things that can go wrong for this segment. Enemies can be hiding behind cover, tanks are hard to hit, uh, there's, there's a lot of stuff. Overall, this was the best segment I got after maybe 100 tries, so I did decide to go with it. Now, the reason why we're grabbing a radio challenge isn't only for the XP, it's because we're waiting for Tina to let us place the bomb on the door, and there it is, it pops up at the perfect time, and then I can hit that save, go for a save quit, and refresh my action skills. Okay, so now time for Warden. This guy, really easy boss fight, not a whole lot to it. The Nimble Jack can easily get the one-shots per phase, and then we gotta wait around a little bit for the immune phases. Like I said earlier, the Grease Trap only works on Rampager, Troy, and Tyreen, so if you try using the alternate fire on this dude, it will not work at all. I gotta say, getting the Warden is pretty nice because it gives you kind of a uh, relaxation moment, because the rest of the anvil was pretty chaotic and everybody needs a breather. Right there, I timed that shot really nicely. The immune phase just ended, and then during editing, I checked, and it was only four frames after I got that shot off. It was all luck, but the timing was pretty nice. From here, we'll scoop up some money from Warden, and then teleport back to Hammerlock while waiting for him to talk to us. And then once he does, we can head back to Bloodmore Basin. Now comes one of my favorite maps in this run, and that is going to be Jacob's Estate. And if you're wondering right there why we didn't save quit right away, it's because we're waiting for the bounty dialogue to overlap Aurelia. And then since Aurelia cannot talk, the mission completes, and then we can go for the save quit. Next up, we can grab a brand new Torg Sticky Launcher, and that's going to be good for a couple bosses coming up. Also, it is going to be the final time we're using the Torg Sticky Launchers for the run. From here, we can take a detour and avoid the slow elevator inside their house. And then we can grab a car and head our way over to Jacob's Estate. Not only does the next map have some pretty cool skips, but it also has two key items we need for the run. The nice thing about this mission is there's no invisible waypoints, so we can just race over ahead of time, and then we can travel to Jacob's Estate without any problems. Just a little bit further to go, it is quite far away. At this point, I think we're only two or three levels under from the main story, so we're looking pretty good on the XP. We'll drive under the tree there, hop out, and drive to the next map. Now, you can actually launch your cyclone up that cliff there and get to the door, but just like Atlas HQ, this map cannot have cars, so that means if you try to travel in a car, it will not let you until you hop out. Anyways, on to Jacob's Estate. Like I said, this map is pretty cool. Now, we are going to go ahead and knock out the radio challenge because it is along the way. We'll do a nice little parkour to get up top faster, and right after this, we're going to be grabbing ourselves the stopgap. So, what we're going to do is jump down and get the snipe on L Dragon for the one-shot kill, get that stopgap, and then do a clone teleport up top. Remember when I said I want to hit 21 once I get to Eden 6? This is the reason for it. We need a stopgap and we need a pestilence. Those drop at level 21, which means I cannot use them till then. We'll go ahead and head over to Heckle and take out the two enemies here. He's going to jump down and we'll go ahead and kill him before he hits the floor. There's our pestilence and level up, so we'll go ahead and spec a point into more violent violence, and then we'll go for that save quit. Now, what is the reason why I want these items so bad? Well, later on, we're going to be flying. Yeah. We'll talk about it a little more once we get to that point, but from here, we're going to go ahead and do the lift skip. So we'll run up the bar, place clone, and then do a clone teleport to get around the lift there. From here, we can rush forward and hit the doorbell. What I'm doing right here with the clone teleport in the photo mode was nothing. Um, I thought that it might have been faster to pause that dialogue to uh, extend it. But it turns out this door opening is animation based, so there's nothing we can do to speed it up. Um, all we can do is wait for Aurelia's hologram on the uh, doorbell to go away. Now we're going to go ahead and jump back in and do a little bit of mopping up ahead. Also, I do want to cycle back to the stopgap real fast. You weren't able to see these stats on the stopgap because I didn't pick it up pretty fast. But that stopgap does have double fleet on it. So if my shield is depleted, it will give me 14% movement speed. Sadly, the stopgap cannot have triple rolls on it like the purple shields. From here, we'll kill off the final enemy and then perform a nice out of bounds. For some reason, the wall right here is not solid, so you can jump right through. And then from here, we can maneuver out of bounds and make our way over to Billy the Anointed. Luckily for us, the save station up ahead can hit through walls, so that means that if we are close enough to it out of bounds, we can trigger it and then uh, go for a save quit to respawn at that save station. The save station by the theater is right here behind that wall, we'll touch it and go for the save quit. Remember earlier we got that Torg Sticky Launcher out of the vendor? Uh, when we bought it, it equipped to our fourth weapon slot that we just unlocked, so we didn't have to bother opening our inventory and wasting time to equip it. Billy really isn't a hard boss, we'll go ahead and stick him up I think like three times, and that's going to easily finish him off. You can see there I did place clone, and now we're going to slide up ahead. And the combination here is always going to be the same. It's going to be 1, 0, 2. 
We'll do that combination and do a clone warp up to the front of the theater. From here, we gotta be speedy speedy because we are gonna be going for a dialogue skip. Now, there isn't any side missions nearby, so we're gonna extend the dialogue using photo mode. Right now, Wainwright is talking away, so we'll go ahead and freeze that dialogue. And what this is gonna do is get the timing for the dialogue off. So the game's gonna be like, oh wait, Wainwright, you should have already mentioned that by now. Well, we're gonna go ahead and activate the failsafe and give you the record early. From here, we can drop down, hit the waypoint, and go back to the Bloodmore Basin. That right there is Jacob's Estate, and honestly, that was a pretty fun map to run through. It has a lot of fun skips. We'll go for that save quit again to skip the Blue Warp Tunnel. Okay, so now we're gonna be heading over to the Reliance, and honestly, Reliance is probably my least favorite part of Eden 6. Uh, it's just a bunch of mobbing, and then you're just save quitting, mobbing, save quitting, mobbing, save quitting. There isn't many skips to be done here, but I can assure you that right after this segment, though, things are going to pick up quite a bit. Anyways, you can see there we did go back to the Jacob's Estate. The reasoning behind that is because if you turn around and go back through the door, then you'll spawn right outside the Reliance, and it's a lot faster to get there that way. From here, we'll place clone, skip the cutscene, and trigger the save station over here, clone teleport back, talk to Clay, and then go for the save quit. That's going to skip over his dialogue. From here, this is going to be quite interesting. So Clay is way over there. We're waiting on him. And as soon as he finishes this line of dialogue, you want to jump up here? Yeah, for some reason he teleports forward. Why? I have no idea. That does save time though, because we're waiting for him to enter the Reliance. So we're going to go ahead and get inside early and then hit the save station. Uh, while waiting for Clay to run all the way over, we're just going to kill a few things for a little bit of XP. There really isn't a whole lot more we can do at this point. Remember, I'm still trying to get to level 21 as fast as possible. All right, Clay checked off. Let's go for that save quit. And from here, we can start the mobbing inside the Reliance. Funny thing here is, if you kill these enemies too fast, then the mission breaks. So I made sure not to kill them super duper fast, but just fast enough to make sure we didn't lose too much time. Now we're going to jump back in, and right away, the bounty dialogue is going to overlap Clay. Since Clay cannot talk, the objective pops up faster, and we can start the mobbing sooner. We'll go ahead and free the two prisoners, and then after that, we can start the mobbing. Now right there, you'll notice I tried to place clone, but for some odd reason, uh, you can't place clone in that very specific location. Very odd. Anyways, it wasn't a waste because it did help me stack my kill skills with my uh, scene red skill. So we'll finish off the final lady right here, which gave me a little bit of trouble, but we didn't miss too many shots. And then we'll go for that save quit. Next up, we'll talk to Clay, so we do have to run forward here and wait for just a second. You have to wait until he runs all the way forward here before he can talk to you. It's alright, Clay. Don't be shy. Go for the save quit and skip over that dialogue. This segment right here, it's not hard, you just have to go forward and shoot the switch. But for some reason I just could not hit it for like 10 segments, but I finally got it for that segment, so it turned out pretty good. From here, the bounty dialogue will overlap play again and spawn the enemies early. So we'll do the usual and shotgun them down and take them out pretty fast. Now, one thing I do want to bring up for the run is how many save quits were in this speedrun. Honestly, I didn't go through and count all of them, I just looked at my segment count. Uh, so it's likely over 300 save quits. To put that into a perspective, if each loading screen is about, I don't know, 10 seconds maybe? That means that this speedrun would be about, uh, what is that, 3000 divided by 60, is that 50? Yeah, 50. That means that over 50 minutes of loading screens have been cut out of this uh, video. Remember, loading screens don't count for time, so it's not a big deal to cut them out. But yeah, 50 minutes, that is quite a bit. Back to the mobbing, these are going to be the same three types of mobbing, so mob the area and then fall back to the gas station. So we'll kill the final couple enemies over here and then clone warp back to hit the waypoint by the gas station. Only two more of those to go, so we'll spawn in and go to the right side where the enemies are going to spawn. And what's nice about this location is there's only four spots they can spawn. So it is pretty easy to watch all the spots and make sure you get the enemies killed as soon as they spawn in. We'll snipe the final enemy, hit the waypoint for the gas station, and go for another save win. One more to go here, we'll go ahead and spawn in and take out these enemies as soon as they get uh, moonshot down. Or not moonshot, that's a uh, Jack and Hyperion stuff, right? Whatever Tyrene does, I guess phase teleport, I don't know what you want to call it. Anyways, we finished all them off pretty smoothly, so we're gonna head up here to the long arm guy. I'm gonna go ahead and get on top of this and do a drop down shot to get the most out of violent momentum, and that will ensure that we get the one shot no matter what, even if we don't crit the enemy. We'll wait for the dust to appear on the ground to know when he's gonna spawn, so there it is. We'll hop down, get the one shot, and go for that sick win. Now is where things are really going to pick up, so what we need to do now is get our way over to the Fort Sunshine. I would run there right away, but there are going to be some required waypoints we have to hit first. So we'll activate the power, go back to Naughty Peak, and save quit the Warp Tunnel. You can see when we load in, we are just about level 21, which is where we want to be. Instead of waiting for the slow elevator, we're just going to go ahead and hop down here and make our way over to the Fort Sunshine. We'll hop down, and we don't do a slam here because the mountain kind of goes outward, so I'd hit the side of the mountain. And we definitely don't want that. From here, we're waiting for the dropship to come in and drop off some enemies, so in the meantime, we're going to run over and get this claptrap for the level up. 
And there we go, level 21. One more point in the Violent Violence, put on our Pestilence, put on our Stopgap, and now we are invincible. Yep, remember, we're using the Infiltrator, which means that when we shoot our cannon or use any action skill, our shield is going to go bold and break. With that in mind, we can trigger the invulnerability from the stopgap at any time we want. Um, I guess I'll let in a little more information here. I don't want to spoil the whole thing, but in order to fly, we got to make sure we're invincible. So that is why the stopgap is so important. Also, this will take care of the problems for mobbing, so I won't be struggling through the mobbing not having a shield. Following up here, we're going to hit the waypoint for the Outlook and then travel back to the Reliance. And obviously, because we get a blue warp tunnel when we travel, we're going to go for that beautiful safe quid. The waypoint checked off now, so let's go ahead and do that. Now, this next part is a little bit unfortunate, so we got to take the crane to Fort Sunshine. And the logs and the crates that go along this crane are on a global cycle. They're not random, so as soon as you spawn in, they're going to be in the same position and the same speed every time. Uh, for the speed that I have right now, even though it's a lot, we are still not fast enough to make our way to the first crate before it takes off. You might be thinking, why not just find a clever parkour to find your way on top of the crate from right here? Sadly, there's going to be a required waypoint we have to hit in front of the uh, donking area. You can see that waypoint on the minimap right now, like we have to hit that. Not a huge deal because along the way we can just kill a few things and get a little more XP. Also, the vault card does level up there, but we're not using vault card stuff for the run. You might be able to see the crane logs way in the distance, that was the one I was referring to. They're just a little bit too fast, but that means we can show off this really cool backup strat. Instead of waiting on the flat ground there, you can actually get on top of this roof. Then from here, you can do a nice long jump onto the crane, trigger the waypoint, and then travel back to the naughty peak. Obviously, riding the crane in Fort Sunshine is very, very slow. So instead, we're going to be doing something really, really cool. Let's go ahead and overheat the pestilence so it breaks and wedge our head into this corner. Because my head is inside the ceiling, the explosions don't actually hurt me. With that happening, I can spam emo and do explosion cancels. Yeah, now we're flying and the stopgap will keep me safe and I can make my way into Fort Sunshine. Uh, basically, the explosions happen so fast that the game cannot keep up because I'm spamming emotes super, super fast. And so they kind of lag behind and after the game can catch up, that's when all the explosions happen and propel me forward. If I did not have the stopgap, the explosions would have caught up and killed me. So we have to make sure that is active once we start flying. Anyways, there's going to be a lot more cool flying tricks later on in the run. So let's get on to this mobbing here. The mobbing here, random enemies, random spawn locations, it's not anything you can perfectly perfect. So we gotta watch the minimap and just look for those red dots as soon as they pop up. You might notice that the enemies are still dropping their spines from that side mission at the droughts that we picked up, the uh, broken vending machine. There is a reason why we're not picking them up, because we're gonna be doing a skip with those late game. It's a while from now, so that skip is not gonna happen anytime soon. Now we're just waiting for the four slow spawning fire psychos to spawn in. And once you take out all four, you'll get Moldock the Anointed. For Moldock, we gotta make sure we kill him really, really fast for a dialogue skip. Unfortunately, his spawn location is random, so I gotta just kinda look out for where he spawns. At that point, I gotta make sure I snipe him fast for the kill before he puts up his shield. He didn't spawn right in front of me, but he did spawn close by, so I got the two-shot kill on him. From here, we can go over to the switch, and the game's gonna get confused because we killed him so fast. So the switch is gonna activate early, so we click that right away. And the dialogue's still way behind, so we can talk to Dalton early. Once we have the key from him, we're gonna go ahead and go back to the Reliant and go for that save quit. At this point now, we only have one hour left for the run. Yeah, when I said we're gonna be going fast, I wasn't kidding. Things are really gonna pick up now. Anyways, we open the gun cabinet and we're gonna go ahead and uh, rush forward here and talk to Clay now. Then we'll head back to Naughty Peak and get ready for Voracious Canopy. Um, Voracious Canopy is also a pretty broken map. We're gonna be completing that pretty fast. There's gonna be some out of bounds, dialogue skipping, photo mode stuff, and much more. We talked to Hammerlock, so at this point we're gonna grab the record and place it in there. And we do need to get some ammo real quick, so we are gonna grab it from right there, and then teleport back. And just like before, we're gonna take the drop down here to get down to the car faster. You can see the textures are kind of smooth because the game's running slowly. Um, I guess during this segment I've already went for a ton of save quits, so the game got a little bit laggy. So we got a car, and we're gonna hop down and drive our way to the voracious canopy. And as soon as we go into the map, we are going to be on a timer and have to perform some tricks really fast. If we don't get these tricks, then we're going to be wasting time, and we definitely don't want that. We'll go into the map and then save quit to split our segment. After that, we need the bounty dialogue from Zane to overlap Balix. But it isn't quite long enough, so what we need to do is extend it using photo mode. So we're going to jump forward and use photo mode. After waiting for a small bit, that should have overlapped all of Balix's uh, voice lines. And then from there, you can see the waypoints already popped up early. That means when we go down here, the dinosaur is going to spawn right away. But we do want to perform another dialogue skip here. So as soon as Zane starts talking, we're going to photo mode that to extend it a little bit longer. 
And now we have to kill the dinosaur and pick up Balix and then freeze the dialogue again. What this is going to do is have the dialogue way behind, which means the game's going to activate the failsafe. We'll pick up Balix there and then hit the door trigger and then pause it again. And now the game's like, oh wait, why are you still talking about the T-Rex? You should not be talking about that. That should have passed. So the door is going to open early, which means we can proceed through a lot faster. Right here, we are going to do a third dialogue skip. Yeah, that's right. So Balix is way behind telling us to kill the dinosaur, but we're way ahead of that. So we hop down into the next waypoint, and now Balix is going to overlap himself, which means that the panel can be activated early, or broken early. We'll cut the wires, hit the save station, click the button, and go for the save quit. But wait, there's more. We're going to be going for another couple dialogue skips up here. So what we're going to do is rush over to the switch and ignore most of the mobs along the way. And there is a nice little jump you can do over this generator thing in the middle. You can mantle over it instead of going all the way around. At this point, Genevieve is talking, so we're going to pause that dialogue with photo mode. And from here, the switch is going to be active a lot earlier. We'll go ahead and click it, and it's going to put us in a fight for your life. And now is where we got to be really fast, so we'll grab a second wind, and now we're going to pause the Balix dialogue on this waypoint. That means the medic loader cannot talk, so we're going to skip over their dialogue and immediately go for the melee to take off the head. There we go, we take off the head, and we'll go ahead and place in Balix. The melee there did look pretty weird, but wherever you're aiming in photo mode is where the melee is going to land. Since I was aiming at the head, that's where it hit. We're not done breaking this map yet, so now we're going to go out of bounds. So you can actually mantle this metal piece here, jump here, and then push yourself through the wall. And then what we're going to do here is skip over one of the optional waypoints. Normally, Balix would open a door and tell you about his real name, but yeah, we're skipping over that. I will say, don't do this trick if you are playing casually. If you do, that door is going to stay closed forever, which means for your casual play, you can never run back to Genevieve. Anyways, we'll hop back and bounce and hit this waypoint, and the game's going to be like, oh wait, Balix should be right here. So Balix teleports into existence out of nowhere. From here, we got to take it a little bit slow to make sure that safe station gets triggered. Turns out if you slide past it, you can skip over it and not actually trigger it. If that happened, that would have been really bad. Proceeding on here, we do have a few mobbing segments we gotta do, and these are gonna be required, there's nothing you can do about it. Right here, we gotta kill six loaders, so there's number one, there's number two, and these guys spawn in the same locations every time. There's number three, there's number four, there's number five, and then finally, there's number six. Go for the save quit. That save quit will skip over the Balix dialogue because there is quite a bit of it, and so at this point, we're gonna rush towards the door and have him open it. Also, I do fix my mission from being the uh, side mission over to the story mission. I'm not sure why the mission swapped out, maybe photo mode stuff does that. Anyways, we'll burn a little bit of time by pointing out our clone for no reason. And then the door is going to slowly open and we can proceed on to the next waypoint. Now, this next area is quite fun because we are going to be using the pestilence for mobbing. Because we can go invincible with the stopgap and just spam explosions all over this area. Now, the reason why we're doing it for this area and nowhere else in the game is because the massive amount of jabbers that there are, it is a little bit slower to snipe every single one of them with a Jacob shotgun. Also, they are small and pretty hard to hit too. So we'll finish off that loader segment, get a level up, and spec into Violent Violence. That's going to give us even more fire rate, which is going to be great for breaking a Pestilence a lot faster. Now the Jabbers are spawning, let's overheat this gun. And we got to make sure we activate our invincibility at the right time so that we don't die from that damage over time. By spamming emote a few times, we can spam that explosion over and over. And if you just watched the minimap, you can see the work that this is actually doing. Quite nice. The bad thing about the stopgap is you can't actually overlap the invincibility if it's already going. Um, you have to wait until the invincibility wears off and then you can use an action skill again to activate it back up. You can't just spam action skill infinitely and then have it always up. It's all about the timing. From here, these guys spawn one by one, so no point to spam the pestilence. We'll wait until they jump down and then finish them off with a few shots. Only a couple more to go, so we'll uh, get the fire guy here. And then the radiation guy in the back. And for the first time this run, we're going to go for a safe quit. Alright, I lied. Coming up here, we're going to go ahead and show off a new trick pretty quick here. So, first off, let's take out the guy that's going to destroy Balix. Now, this guy is invincible for a little bit, so we do have to wait before we start shooting him. Once we kill him off, we can grab Balix and then proceed on to the next waypoint. We are going to be doing another dialogue skip, and one of the objectives coming up is broken. Not broken in a bad way, broken in a good way. So, we'll grab some ammo and then do a couple action skill cancels to keep our speed up. Right now, Genevieve is talking, so we are going to pause that dialogue after this clever parkour right here. Okay. And so we're going to delay that dialogue for a little bit, which means we can activate the switch a lot earlier. Once we do that, we're going to activate our invincibility with the stopgap and then proceed to do another dialogue skip here. And that means we can place Balix in the suit a lot faster. All right, on to that broken objective I was talking about. So if you leave only one of these loaders alive, you can kill off the final one as soon as Balix says, hey, kill those rats. Once we kill off this final loader here, watch the objective. We'll wait for a little bit longer. 
There it is. And yeah, somehow we killed all the badge killing that final loader. I, I don't know, don't ask. Either way, that does save quite a bit of time because killing those rats are very, very slow. From here, we're gonna make our way to Genevieve and you can see the textures in my game are loading very slowly. Yeah, it was probably time for another game reset, but what caused all those resets? This guy right here is Spinny Arms McSpinny Pants. I need that XP badly because I did skip all those rats. That guy is just flat out unfair. He just spins his arms and there's barely any ways to kill that guy fast. You just gotta get a very lucky shot. Right there, we went for the save quit to get the bounty dialogue. And with that in mind, we can extend the dialogue over Balix and then have Genevieve spawn way earlier. From here, we'll go for four good sticks. And then that should be the insta kill. We'll grab the vault key and then leave Balix on the floor and then get out of here. Don't worry guys, if you don't pick up Balix, it still picks him up automatically for you when you get back to Sanctuary. Thanks to Bounty Dialogue again, it's gonna skip over Genevieve, which means we can go straight to the bridge. I discovered a pretty odd trick here too. This first loader down on the bottom floor, if you kill that guy as soon as the objective pops up, you can skip killing all the other loaders at the bridge and hit the waypoint. So the clone killed off that loader and allows us to proceed forward a lot faster. Now we get a safe sanctuary from being taken over by Genevieve. All it is is a race to the front of the bridge, do the objective, and then go for a save quid. In fact, we're gonna do this two times. Uh, I did try overlapping dialogue here to see if we could do it faster, but the dialogue is not the part that's holding you up, it's the animations. These specific animations cannot be skipped unless you save quit, so we're just gonna rinse and repeat what we did before. Race to the front of the bridge, do the objective, and then save quit again. Now that Balix shoved Genevieve into this Game Boy Pocket, we're gonna go back to Marcus and give it to him for no reason whatsoever. Like, he says he has an idea of what to do with Genevieve, but he never tells us. Either way, I'm not interested, I'm trying to go fast, so here you go dude, and I'm out of here. Next up, we gotta give the Valkyrie to Tannis, so we'll do some clever parkour to get up to the second floor faster. And you gotta make sure you talk to her fast here. If you don't, she's gonna do some idle dialogue, and that's not good. Now we're heading back to the Reliance, and we're gonna be off to Ambermire. Now, Ambermire is a pretty interesting map. There is gonna be another Pestilence jump, so we're gonna be flying across the map. And there are gonna be some cool skips and dialogue skips too. We'll grab the Rogue Sight from Clay, and then go ahead and skip over his dialogue with a save quit. Funny thing here is you don't even need the Rogue Sight at all. The targets never move, so if you memorize their locations, you can just shoot them with anything. Alright, so we have the rogue site, we're gonna grab a car and proceed on to Ambermire. And there is this interesting glitch coming up. To open the Ambermire door, you have to shoot the three rogue site targets. But for some odd reason, if you slide or use any kind of splash damage in that general area, they will all automatically break and the door is gonna open early. You can see we're sliding through this area and watch the targets. They break. So odd. Anyways, we enter Ambermire and we're gonna go for that save quit. The next waypoint is going to be to approach the Rogue's Hollow, and what we're going to do is fly across the map to get there. And this one's a little bit hard to land because, remember, you only get 5 seconds of invulnerability from the stopgap. We're going to be flying for more than 5 seconds, which means the Pestilence will down us. Luckily though, I went for a lot of resets to make sure Clone could get me a second wind. So we're just going to fly through the air, and then the Pestilence is going to catch up and kill us. And then Clone's going to do its beautiful thing and give me a second wind, and I can activate the stopgap again. From here, we are right where we need to be. We'll shoot the rogue site mark, and then the door is going to open and we can proceed on to the next waypoint. Luckily, there is a save station right there, which means we can skip that dialogue with the save quit. Now it's going to be a bunch of interacting with waypoints and save quitting, so it's a pretty good time to bring up the pestilence jumping again. Later on in the run, we do have to do some pretty long and big jumps, and we cannot have the pestilence downing us while that happens. There is a way to chain at 10 seconds of invulnerability. But we cannot do that till later on because we need to get a last stand artifact. When we're doing small distance jumps like the one over to Fort Sunshine, 5 seconds of invulnerability is enough, but yeah, when you do the big jumps later on, we need all of the invulnerability we can get. Anyways, back to Ambermire here, we're gonna click the loot tracker, and then we're gonna hop down and make our way to the save station and save quit again. This save quit was a little bit risky because we were barely close enough to that save station for it to trigger. Um, the main reason though we want to save quit is because we want the sellout mission to overlap the dialogue coming up. Also, just like the Mendel quest over on Athena's, this mission gives a crap ton of XP. We'll do a nice parkour skip here, jumping on the dryer and mantling that thing and then going up and over, and that will save us from going all the way around. From here, we are going to photo mode to extend the dialogue a little bit longer, and that's going to make the rogue site mark pop up earlier, and we can go ahead and destroy that. This part is just even more mobbing, there's nothing really to it. We just gotta make sure our shots are on point and we don't miss too much. I do remember this segment was pretty nice, we didn't get any like crazy bad mobs. Uh, if I recall, we didn't get a single car door guy, I think. Anyways, uh, yeah, we'll go ahead and get those crits and knock them out in one shot. Technically, I could snipe them as soon as they're zipping down on the zipline, but they zip down so fast that it's really hard to hit them. So I wait until they land to go for those shots. I'm only human guys, I don't have aimbot. 
We'll get the long shot in the back. Long shot enemies are pretty scary too. They can one shot all of your HP. So you gotta make sure you take them out fast before they get you. Well, I forgot we had the stopgap, so who cares? Anyways, yeah, we killed all the enemies. We're gonna rush over to the mailbox, place our clone. And now we're waiting for the waypoint to pop up so we can pick up the thing. What was that thing again? The ID, right. We'll pick up the ID, we'll teleport back, shoot the mailbox, pick up the thing, and then we're gonna go ahead and inventory open and close real fast. That puts away the echo a lot faster so you can run. From here, we'll finish the sellout mission by clicking the button and going for a save quit. Hey, I'm not a sellout, okay? I save quit, we never died. Take that, Tyrene. Anyways, we leveled up, another point into violent violence. Now we're off to find Quiet Foot and take on the Mudlet Clan. On the way though, we are gonna take out the Unstoppable because it is a nice chunk of XP. Because we did a sit quit earlier, the dialogue got skipped over, which means we can activate that switch right away. And now we'll take on the clan, which is even more mobbing. The nice thing about ziplining enemies is they jump and fall in the same spot every time. So if you watch those locations, you can hit them as soon as they hit the floor. That is going to be the perfect time because they're not going to be moving at that point. I do want to take out all the enemies up front first and then make my way back. Once we get to the back area, we can finish off the couple of enemies and then place our clone. From there, we're going to be waiting on dialogue so we can rush over to the next save station. We're going to slide over there now make sure we hit it just a little bit further and there we go. It has been triggered. We'll clone teleport back and we're still waiting for that dialogue. So as soon as it's over, we should be able to grab the thing here. We got it. Let's go for that save quit and spawn over by that save station. Now that we're over here, we're going to rush towards the next waypoint and this one is a little bit tricky for the mobbing. The docks are multi-leveled, so it's really hard for mobbing. So there wasn't a whole lot we could do here except for pray that we had good spawns and also the enemies spawned uh, mostly up top. I'm going to focus on the enemies up top first, so we do have a Goliath there, but we take them out pretty fast. And we do want to make sure we take out the tanks before they build sentry turrets. You don't have to kill the turrets for the mobbing, but when you look at the minimap, you're going to see a red dot where the turret is. I'm focused on that minimap, so I will kill any red dot I see. Luckily though, we did mob fast enough so no turrets were able to be built. We'll take out the final guy here, which is going to spawn that ship. From here, we do want to race our way up to the top of the tower so that we can place our clone. Um, because now we're going to be going for another dialogue skin. I don't want to talk about that ladder jump there, that was pretty sad. Either way, it didn't waste time, we were still waiting for the drop ship to spawn in the enemies. Now they're going to spawn in, and at this point we got to make sure we mob them really, really fast. So we'll take out the final guy here, get the ricochet, teleport up, and freeze that dialogue. Right here is going to be the controls. We'll wait until it starts sparkling, which means it's active. There it goes. We'll click the button. Now we'll go up the ladder as fast as we can and get on top of the crane. Just a small bit more to go. We can go ahead and slide over here and then hit the scanner. We'll fall down. Give it a small boop and save quit. Now, the cool thing about save quitting there is you skip an entire thing of mobbing. Normally, another drop ship would fly in and drop off a bunch of enemies and you would kill them off, but I guess they're not required. Save quitting is the key. Anyways, from here, we're going to race our way over to the porta potty and get the Echo device. And then we'll teleport back to the Rogue's Hollow. We'll jump back in, and there's going to be a waypoint right in front of the door here. We're going to trigger that and go for a save quit again. Uh, that save quit only saves like one second, but hey, time save is time save. We'll proceed to hop down and spawn the loot tracker. Then from here, we do have a lot of unskippable dialogue. You cannot save quit this or overlap the dialogue either. So, we do what we do best, and we're going to go hunt for some XP. Right next to us is going to be the radio challenge. We'll do a few mantles to get up on top. It really isn't a hard parkour to do. And then from there, we can jump and barely get that mantle. I don't know how I got that. And we'll uh, finish that challenge for a bunch of XP. We did clone teleport back, and now we're going to perform a pretty cool skip. So, if you kill at least one or two mobs in this first mobbing area, the loot tracker is going to slowly make its way to that location and be like, Oh, wait, it's already done. That means we can go to the final mobbing area, which is going to become active as soon as we get there. And we'll just take out the few enemies that spawn in this location. So what's going to happen is the loot tracker is going to think all the mobbing is done after this location. And that will teleport the loot tracker right to the elevator. Anyways, we did level up, so we're finally going to get some healing by specking in the salvation. And we'll finish off the final enemy here, and the loot tracker is going to teleport forward. We'll click the elevator and jump on top and freeze that dialogue. And that's going to make the dialogue get lagged behind, which means that the Archimedes is going to spawn a lot faster. We'll rush forward and we're going to freeze the dialogue one more time here. The game's going to activate the failsafe and spawn him right away to make sure the mission doesn't lock up. And with the nice level up bonus for double damage for a short time, we can get the one shot kill. We'll crack this guy open and take the vault key and then we're going to be on our way back to Sanctuary. Now guys, we only have one more major map for Eden 6. I told you, we were going to fly through Eden 6 pretty fast. At this point, the Nimble Jag is 10 levels under from the main story, and it is starting to fail to get those one-shots consistently, so we're going to be upgrading our shotgun right now. 
You might be asking what shotgun is next. Well, in the Marcus Fender over here is going to be, uh, yeah, the Hellwalker. So we'll sell off our Nimble Jack and then buy the Hellwalker, which is going to auto equip it on our person. And then we're going to buy a pistol and shotgun SDU. The reason why we got a pistol one is because I do want that ammo for the pestilence. And the shotgun one is pretty self-explanatory. Now we are going to be off to the Black Barrel Cellars. And coming up right here is going to be one of the coolest pestilence launches we're going to be doing for this run. I will say right now, this jump right here took so many resets because it's super duper precise. And also, I didn't want to overcharge the jump because if I did, it would down me. Um, it pretty much took precision and luck to get this segment. We also had to get pretty lucky not to take a nasty damage over time from the pestilence explosions too. That is the benefit for not charging for too long. We'll meet up with Clay and talk to him real fast. And while waiting for him to get all the way over to the door, we're going to charge a pestilence jump. Sorry for the blinding light. I do have to make sure I charge it for just long enough so that we can get a good jump, and also so we don't take off until Clay actually starts running towards the objective. If you're not standing by Clay long enough, he's not going to run forward. Right now, the game's catching up and thinking, oh wait, those explosions should be going off. So we'll place our clone, zoom off, get our invincibility for a short time, and we're going to fly up and over to Chong Stomp's arena. Now, we're not killing this guy just for the XP, but we need his dialogue to overlap Clay. So what we're going to do is zoom forward and make sure Clay keeps running by standing near him. And then we're going to stand by the door and pause Hammerlock's dialogue with Feta Mode. From here, Clay's going to run over and he can't talk, so he's going to open that door right away. Hey, win-win. We get XP and also a fast door. All right, off to the Black Barrel Cellars. Very, very cool skip. In fact, I'm going to say, the skip, dude. Um, I had the idea there on paper and I never thought it was going to work. In fact, I did almost give up on trying to get that skip at a few points, but I pushed through and pulled it off. Along the way here, we are going to grab that Claptrap, free XP, why not? Also, I do want to knock out all the challenges for this map for the XP. So on my left side here, we're going to grab the Typhon Log. There's number one. And now we're going to make our way over to the Delivery Pipe and take on a bunch of mobs. This Hellwalker, yeah, it's pretty OP. A while back, it did get a huge buff, and it's pretty broken. What were they thinking? <laughs> the mobbing is pretty straightforward, and what we're going to do up here is place our clone next to the uh, Delivery Pipe. And after we finish off the few mobs up ahead, we can clone teleport back and trigger the waypoint. Yep, there's the clone, and we'll just finish off the enemies in the back. Keep in mind, I could have done Hellwalker strats for this whole entire run, but I wanted to keep the run interesting, so I made sure to save the most OP stuff for the end of the run. The mobbing is complete, we'll teleport back, hit that waypoint, and go for the save quit. From here, we skipped over that dialogue, so we can run forward and trigger the waypoint again. The waypoint being that delivery pipe, that is. And the delivery pipe is an animation-based thing, so we cannot overlap dialogue on that with the bounty dialogue. So a save quit is needed if we want to skip over that. Wainwright's going to give us a bunch of false alarms on the delivery pipe, so we're going to go ahead and hit it one more time here. So we'll place clone back by the mobbing area, and then we'll click the button, teleport back, and we'll finish off the last required mobbing segment for this map. This mobbing segment, I gotta say, did go pretty well. Uh, we were able to snipe a few enemies before they could jump all the way down, and also we did not get too many shield guys. We did get a couple of them, but they weren't too bad, and we one-shot them pretty fast. From here, enemies are going to spawn up on the upper balconies, and we'll snipe them before they get down. And now we'll make our way to the back area where the last few enemies are. This lady did give me a little bit of trouble, but we did get the shot off right after that. From here, we're waiting for the hag enemy to spawn, and that's going to be a good sign, showing that it's the final few enemies. We'll take her out pretty fast, and go for the final dude here, and then we're going to go for that save quin. Alright, it's finally time to make our way over to Aurelia, and Aurelia isn't really that bad of a boss. Thanks to the stopgap. Oh my goodness, if we did not have the stopgap for this fight, it would have been awful. The whole room is just filled with area of effect damage, and it's pretty annoying. Most stuff in there is nearly undodgeable. Anyways, we'll shoot the barrel as it falls down and get the vault key fragment, and if you grab it fast enough, you can get a dialogue skip here to open the store early. From here, we're all about the speed, and we're gonna race our way over to the second Typhon log. We never get a chance to listen to it though, because Wainwright's gonna cut off Typhon right away and just check off that objective. So that's gonna be two out of three on the left side of the screen. Awesome. I do want to make sure that we get a perfect fight, so I did hit the save station right there and went for a save quit. Also, that will refresh my action skills, getting me ready for this fight. Since we do have the Hellwalker, the fight's going to be pretty straightforward, so we're going to skip the cutscene and get right up in Aurelia's face and go for those critical hits. For the first phase, it doesn't matter how fast you clear out her HP. No matter what, she always has to run to the center of the room and then do her tornado attack. After that, I'm going to go ahead and ping her to make sure I can keep track of her after the ice breaks. It will make it much easier to track her, so we'll break that and shoot her in the face and she will immediately go back into the ice cycle we'll break that again and do the third phase she falls out go for a decent shot and that's going to be phase number three from here we got to wait for her to encase herself in ice so we'll place clone by hammerlock and wainwright then we'll break that final cycle of ice and go ahead and finish her off 
Now for this fight, we had to make sure we got a last stand artifact. So you will see here, I'm going to pick it up off the floor. There it is. Then we'll clone teleport back, talk to Hammerlock, and go for that save quit. Remember, the last stand is something we need if we're going to be Pestilence flying really, really far. We need that extra invulnerability. Alright, now we're going to go ahead and go off to the estate grounds. For this, we just got to tag the three statues, and then we're good to go. So for the first one, we get to shoot it in the head, and that's going to check off. Now the second one, we got to hit it from behind, so we need to use splash damage. Uh, we'll put that point into more salvation for healing, and we're going to use that longbow grenade we got from early game. And we're going to snipe the second one with the grenade from very, very long range. We got the hit there, and instead of backtracking, we're just going to go for a save quit. Honestly, both ways are probably about the same speed. From here, we're going to equip the cannon again and make our way to the third statue. Also in this room, we have to get the third Typhon Log too. We'll jump down and ignore most of the enemies, and I think I actually killed the guy outside the door here because he kind of blocks you. Yeah, I did, okay. Plus he has decent XP, so I do want that. We'll do a little mantling off the door to make my way up to the third Typhon Log really fast. And then we'll skip the log with another Typhon Log to get that challenge done. The Typhon Stash is unlocked now, so we are going to grab that too. So we'll make our way to the bridge and activate that and place Clone. While slowly waiting for the bridge to spawn in, we're going to race our way to the Typhon Stash. And with the speed we have, we can make it over there very fast and get back with no problem. We only care about the XP, so once we open it, we're going to teleport back and we're going to be heading over to Grave Ward. I will say now for this boss, make sure you don't blink. For the Floating Tomb, we're going to go for a safe quit right away to refresh our action skills. And then we can triple spam our cannon, place clone, and get all the speed to make our way over to Tannis. We're going to pass up Tannis for just a second to hit the safe station right there. And then she's going to slowly ask for the vault key, and we're just going to place that in her hands. From here, we do have a little bit of time to burn, so we're going to wait for Tannis to build the vault key. In the meantime, we're going to restock our ammo and sell off our garbage. At this point in the run, money doesn't really matter anymore, but I still want to make sure I have a clean inventory. Now, I know I'm just spewing out information about this run, but remember earlier I did mention that I want to get Violent Violence for the fire rate? I also mentioned it will be helping us with the Jacob Shotgun because they do have a capped fire rate. So, we're going to use the Swap Reload glitch and turn our Hellwalker into a machine gun. But after we take out Graven Ward, oh, they're dead. Jacob's Ricochet. Two kills. Alright, Grave Ward, we're going to hop off, and he is also dead. <laughs> oh, it's so silly. Also, I did utilize falling off the map for the most out of Violent Momentum. And then we just clone ward back up before we fall all the way into the void. Now, Grave Ward is kind enough to drop us, well, yeah, um, not that, but this thing right here. Another Hellwalker. But that's going to be a 29, so that is a ways off. Basically, we now have everything we need for the rest of the run. From here, we gotta wait for Tannis to check off, so we're just kind of burning time. This is an animation-based thing, so you can't save quit it to skip over it. Grave Ward's over here reflecting his life choices while I'm thinking about going for, well, you guessed it again, that beautiful save Quinn. Come on, Tannis, you're totally not a siren, how can we tell? From here, we're gonna jump back in, and now it's off to the vault. All we gotta do is grab the thing inside the vault, and then we are good to go. We'll quickly spec our point into even more healing just to make sure we don't die. Then while waiting for the vault to spawn all the way in, we'll get another adrenaline rush. Teleport back, and now the vault is open. We'll jump inside the vault here, grab the thing inside, and then we're going to get ready to head to Pandora again. I don't know about you guys, but I am a fan of Pestilence jumping, and Pandora is going to have a lot of those. I can't wait to show them off. We got the alien thingy out of the vault, so now we're going to hop down and stand by Tannis for one millisecond. And then we're going to head back to Sanctuary. This Sanctuary segment is going to be a little bit longer, but we're not going to be here for too long. There's going to be another animation-based thing, so we cannot skip over that, sadly. The goal from here is going to be to rush to the front of the bridge, and then we're going to meet up with our good friend Lilith and talk to her real fast. So we'll zoom forward, press the interact button once, and then we're going to go for that save quit. Like I mentioned a second ago, this is going to be an animation based thing. You can see in the corner that we don't even have an objective. Uh, up on the bridge, Tyrene and Troy are bragging about kidnapping Tannis. So in the meantime, we're just going to do a little bit of shopping. Right there, I did buy another shotgun and a launcher SDU this time. Yeah, we are going to be doing a little bit of rocket jumping pretty soon here. Speaking of rocket jumping, I did not sell my Ruby's Wrath on accident. I sold my fourth weapon slot, that Torg Launcher. Then I sold my Ruby's Wrath and then bought it back. What that'll do is automatically equip it on slot number four. And that means I can avoid pausing the game to open my inventory to equip it. Right there, I did grab myself a quick Whispering Ice with Action Skill and Radiation. That will just give us a little more damage on Action Skill end. From here, we'll burn a little more time by spamming emote really, really fast. This won't do anything, but it is kind of funny to see the third person glitch out. All we can do now is wait for Lilith to pop up in the corner. And once she does, we can go back to Pandora and travel our way to the Droughts. It shouldn't be that much longer, and I'm gonna say right now, prepare yourselves for a lot of Pestilence jumping. 
We're about to break this game apart. Anyway, she popped up, so off we go. Now, I've always found it quite odd that you get the Pandora cutscene as soon as you get to this point in the game. Uh, we did go ahead and skip over that too. Um, I feel like that cutscene was supposed to be played at the beginning of the game, like when you first enter the Droughts or Covenant Pass or something. In my opinion, it doesn't really make sense to play it after we've already been to Pandora for quite a long time. Either way, we're off to the Devil's Razor, and we're gonna go ahead and perform a Pestilence Jump as soon as we enter that map. Yeah, driving all the way to Roland's Rest to meet up with Vaughn is kinda slow, and we don't like slow, so we're gonna bust out our wings and fly. Right there, if you speed forward to the door, you get a nice dialogue skip to shoot it open right away. And now we're gonna go for a safe quit to split that segment. Pestilence jumping is very, very difficult. In fact, if you're looking at this and thinking, oh, that's easy, I can do that. Uh, it's really not, it's very, very precise. We wedge the top of our head in this car so that the explosions don't kill us right here. And I don't think I mentioned it, but the direction you walk after unwedging your head is where you're gonna fly towards. So by walking towards the general waypoint, it's gonna make us fly all the way over there. Ideally, I would have loved to land on top of the save station and go for a safe quit right away. But again, these jumps are very, very precise and impossible to perfect. Also for that jump, I had to reset many, many times to pray to the RNG gods that the damage over time that we applied to ourselves did not actually kill us. Anyways, you saw there we did our first rocket jump using the Ruby's Wrath and the stopgap. So because we are invincible with the stopgap, the Ruby's Wrath didn't actually kill us. We did talk to Vaughn, so now we're going to head off to the Splinterlands. Um, it's kind of a theme with these desert maps, and we're going to do another Pestilence jump. The funny thing about this jump coming up though is it only saves about like 5 seconds. But again, a time save is a time save. Don't worry though, later on we are going to be doing some pretty big jumps that save well over a minute. But for now, let's focus on the Splinterlands. For the most part, this massive map really isn't that long to do. All we gotta do is get the Golden Chariot car and then we're out of here. While heading over to attempt to enter the festival, we're gonna take a detour to hit a safe station. And at the safe station is gonna be where we're gonna be doing our Pestilence Jump. For Pestilence Jumping, it's really hard to find a good location for the launches. Uh, you can't just go into a corner and do it anywhere. You have to find a very precise spot that puts your head inside the ceiling. Otherwise, the explosions after the gun breaks will down you. We'll park the car there and go ahead and click the button. And the guy is going to tell us, ew, your car is ugly, get a new one. That is going to be our goal now, so we'll get the golden chariot, so let's fly. So we'll charge up a decent jump, but not for too long, because we don't want to take a nasty damage over time. Then from here, we'll wait for the game to catch up, and all the explosions will uh, kick us forward. Another reason why some of the launches are very, very precise is because there are going to be a lot of invisible walls around maps. If you bump into an invisible wall, you lose all of your speed, and then you don't get any distance. You don't want that. Yeah, you saw right there, we landed almost on top of it, which was very nice. And on top of that, we went for a save quit to skip over Big Donnie's dialogue. That's going to make it so that door opens a lot earlier. Now our goal is to do a bunch of mobbing up ahead, and then kill off Big Donnie to get the Golden Chariot. This mobbing here isn't too easy because we do have a ton of spawn locations, so the best thing we could do is watch the minimap and hope that they spawn near us. I do take out the enemies up top first before I jump down, and now we can just watch the other spawn locations down below and take them out when they pop up. The issue here is there's a broken down car right there next to me, and attached to it are four spawn locations, one for each wheel. So even if you see them pop up on the minimap, you cannot tell which one it's going to be. The red dots are just way too close together. Anyways, we'll finish off the final enemy here, and here's going to be Big Donnie. And now I don't want to snipe him before he jumps all the way down because the key can fall into the void. So we'll wait till he hits the floor, and then we'll uh, pick up the key. If you do have a really good eye, you can see what a key is before it pops up. And for this segment, I was able to spot it and pick it up right away. From here, we'll do a little bit of parkour and make our way up to the button. Right after that, we'll teleport back to the beginning of the map and go for a safe quit. Now, for my first couple playthroughs, I used to think you had to take the golden chariot right there and drive it all the way over. But that is not the case. You can grab it from any car station and spawn it right in. Like any of the custom story cars, it does take a second to spawn in, so it gives me time to go buy ammo. From here, we'll drive the golden chariot to the waypoint, and I'll get it scanned real fast and head to the next map. Guys, at this point we have hit the 2 hour mark, so we only have a little bit more to go. I will say now, things are going to pick up fast pretty quick here. Remember, we did get a snowdrift victory rush from the slot machine early game, but minimum level for artifacts in this game is level 27. Look at my XP. Yeah, we are just about there. Also, we need that snowdrift for the next map anyways, because yeah, we're going to need all the speed we can get for the next map. We'll scan the golden chariot and press the button, and then proceed our way on. Sadly, you cannot place clone behind the wall here. Um, this thing is actually a flat solid wall. It looks like there is a few gaps in it, but there is not. We'll head to Carnivora, do a safe quit to refresh our action skills, and then we're going to do another super jump. 
We'll load back into the map here, and right at the beginning of the map is a perfect pestilence jump spot. Dude, I almost think they put this tire here just for this jump. Anyways, we'll do a very small charge here because we do not have far to go, and then we'll place clone to immediately activate our stop cap. Luckily for this map, the waypoint is a lie, and it will automatically kick forward here. So now the waypoint's at the door here, we'll open that up and skip that cutscene. From here, we need level 27, so what we're gonna do is grab this radio challenge right here. Now, there is an invisible wall right in front of it, so we're gonna use photo mode to push through it and grab it from photo mode. There's our level up, let's go ahead and save quit before we fall in the void. And now we have our snow drift to speed kill carnivora. I did have to reset this segment multiple times to make sure he spawned at that right location. Um, sometimes he could be across the map when you load in, and that would ruin it. Right there, we did spec our point into more salvation for healing, and now we're gonna go ahead and slide our way to the boss. Yeah, the car for this segment is slow, and it takes a lot of shots to break the tanks, but using the gun damage that Zane can deliver, he can easily one-shot these. I do want to point out too, this guy looks like he doesn't move that fast, but he is freaking fast. Uh, we barely have enough speed to keep up with them and actually take him out. From here, he's gonna spawn two guaranteed cars, so we'll uh, snipe him as they fall down. And you can see I am action skill canceling too with my inventory because it is really hard to mash the combo uh, while you're spamming slide for this fight, so I can't actually do the inventory list action skill cancel. We just finished the tank in the front, and now we'll finish off the final two cars. And the tank in the back can be shot through the bottom of the car, so we finished that off right there. That, my friends, is Carnivora. Not too bad of a fight. Uh, that guy tried to sneak up on me right there. Uh, now we can head our way into the guts of Carnivora. Even though the next map is pretty small, there are going to be quite a few cool skips. So, for this map, it is pretty straightforward. You just have to run all the way to the top and take on the boss. But along the way, some of these waypoints are going to be required to trigger. You can't just fly to the top and take on Agonizer. What I'm going to do is skip over some of the waypoints. Uh, we're only going to hit the required ones, and that can be achieved by just cutting a few corners. Because we are running a long distance, we'll do a few action skill cancels along the way. In this room here, there is going to be a nice skip we can do. So what we're going to do is run forward and make our way to the upper left part of the room. If you get on top of this tank, you can do either a rocket jump, clone teleport, grenade jump, whatever, and make your way up to the top area here. I chose to do a rocket jump because I do want to save my clone for the area up ahead. Up ahead where you find the tank train mini boss is going to be a required waypoint. So what we're going to do here is some clever parkour to get up to the second area faster. So you can do a bunch of mantling off this stuff and make your way up and over. From here we're going to place clone, hop down and grab the claptrap for some XP. There we go, not a bad chunk. That waypoint on the minimap right there is required, you have to hit it. So we'll kill off tank train for a bit of XP, hit that waypoint and then clone warp back. At this point, the only waypoint we have left is to hit the elevator. It doesn't matter which button you choose, but we'll get a nice dialogue skip here to click it early. And then we'll mantle this metal piece to get up on top of the elevator. From here, I do want to skip the elevator, so we're going to do a nice rocket jump. We make our way up, hit the save station, and we're going to go for that save quit. Time for Agonizer. Just like all the bosses in the speedrun so far, not that bad. So we're going to give him the Grave Ward treatment and rapid fire him with the Hellwalker. Bop, 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 bop. You're dead. At this point, there's not a whole lot we can do except wait for dialogue, so we are going to go ahead and rocket jump our way back to the vendor. From here, I can favor a few items and make sure I don't sell them on accident. And now we're just waiting for Tannis to finish her dialogue so we can kill off the Agonizer. There we go, we'll hop down and shoot the core in one shot. Boop. Now we're going to skip the cutscene, kill off Pain and Terror, and go for a save quit right away. Funny thing here is if you kill Pain and Terror way too fast, uh, it'll break the mission, so we got to make sure we don't do that. Next up, Tannis is waiting for that conversation, so we'll jump down and we'll uh, talk to her real fast. Before she can say a single word, we head back to Sanctuary. Luckily, the Sanctuary segment isn't too long. All we have to do from here is run to the front of the ship and talk to Lilith. Right after that, we're going to travel our way back to the Devil's Razor, and we'll save Vaughn from being attacked by COV. You might have noticed there that Genevieve is still taking over our ship. I don't know why it happens, but yeah, it, it's a bug. A pretty funny one, actually. We're at the Devil's Razor, we'll go for a save quit to skip that warp tunnel. And then from here, we're gonna one-shot the mobs and take them out pretty fast. Just like any COV mobbing, this did take a few resets because of the shield guys. Thank goodness for this segment, we didn't get one. Now we're going to encounter Brayden, another anointed dude. We'll hop down and get a nice ricochet for the kill. And then from here, we did hit level 28, which means we finally got Death Follows close. This skill gives me not only more duration on my kill skills, but also even more bonuses off of them, so that means even more speed. Awesome. We'll do a rocket jump up to Vaughn and teleport back. From here, we're gonna grab a car and head our way over to the Cathedral of the Twin Gods. Sadly, it's gonna be guarded by turrets, and even if I pestilence fly over them, they will aimbot you and one-shot kill you. 
Our goal is going to be to hit the trigger, and for some odd reason, if you just drive off this corner here, you can hit the trigger faster. Yes, your character will die, but Tannis talks right away, which means we can go for the safe win. Very odd. I've seen it in speedruns, and I don't know exactly who found that skip, but it's a thing. From here, we're going to grab a random side mission, and that's going to skip over one. And that means we can go ahead and talk to him right away. Also, because Claptrap's dialogue is so long here, Vaughn cannot do any of his dialogue, which means he's just going to be like, Alright, man, I'm going to run over to the Conrad's whole door and open it up right away. While waiting on Vaughn, we're going to run over and kill Antelope for a little bit of XP. And you can see my clone duration gets very, very low, so we only have a little bit of time to get that kill off. We'll teleport back, and Vaughn's just about over to the door. The reason why we don't photo mode right there to skip that line of dialogue is because Vaughn will turn around and run back. I don't know why he does that. Anyways, I'm spamming a piece of the door, so as soon as it activates, we'll uh, travel. Now, Conrad's Hold is a pretty cool map too, because we're not going to be here for that long. And also because there is going to be another Pestilence jump too. You'll notice there I slide forward and then go for a save quit. Um, and that location will trigger Tannis' dialogue. And by save quitting, it's going to make our dialogue repeat again. But this time, the waypoint's going to unlock early. We'll shoot the tank, which is required, and then we're going to go for another jump. I do put on my last gen artifact because I want to make sure I don't die. Even though it's not apparent in this run, the damage over time kills me so much and causes so many resets for these segments. We'll do a small charge here because we are going to be going up and over straight to the main bark area. The waypoint on the map right now is also a lie, so we're skipping over that. But yeah, right there you can see my shield got wiped off, we got our 5 seconds of invulnerability, and then my health got deleted below half and then activated the last hand artifact. Without it, I would have been dead. The waypoint skips all the way up ahead to shoot down the pipe, so we'll do that and then head our way to Tannis' secret lab. At this point in the run, XP is not really an issue anymore, so stopping to do out of the way challenges is not going to be needed. Now if I am waiting around and there's nothing else to do, I will finish off a challenge. But for the most part, being underleveled at this point is not a huge deal because Hellwalker, it's a thing. We're waiting for this Tannis dialogue to pass so we can hit the minecart with a melee. And as far as I know, there's no way to actually dialogue skip that. Up ahead is going to be two Varkid nests that spawn a few Varkids, and those are the only ones you have to kill off. All the ones behind you don't matter at all. We'll kill off the final one, place clone, and go for the melee on the minecart one more time here. Then we'll clone warp back, get the melee, and use the Ruby's Wrath to shoot all four of these things really bit fast. Now that we hit them all, we're going to hit the switch and head off to the driving map. Don't worry guys, we're barely going to be driving in this map. Why? You guessed it. We're going to fly. We'll load back in, and we do want to get outside because this whole cave is solid. Like, we can't just fly through the ceiling. So we'll pop on our snowdrift and proceed our way to our wedge spot. I kid you not, I feel like they just give us wedge spots to like fly across the map. Because right outside here is going to be a perfectly tilted car that we can just wedge ourselves under. We'll put the last stand back on to make sure we don't die, and this is going to be a huge jump. In fact, when we are flying, look at the minimap. Normally, I think this map takes about two and a half minutes or something to drive through, and we're going to be saving over a full minute just by doing this jump. We did charge a pretty long jump, and off we go. There is one required waypoint for this map, so we do have to make sure we land near it and destroy the giant tank thing. From here, I'm watching my minimap and making sure to slam at the right time to go back down. That seems like a decent time, so we'll just fall all the way back down here. Thank goodness for no fall damage. Now we're pretty much all the way at the end. We'll go back to our snowdrift, hit the required waypoint, and then proceed on. Yeah, this whole map you don't have to drive through at all. In fact, if you really wanted to, you could just run it on foot. The only part you have to drive on is the very end where you gotta park the car. Right here, the tank does take a little bit to break, so we have to shoot it a few times. And from here, it's just a race to the end of the map. This map went from being one of the most boring in the run to being one of the most fun. Quite interesting. Thank you, Pestilence Jumping. After this mission, Vaughn does give us the red suit, and you might be thinking, Oh, red suit. You can use that now for your Pestilence flying, right? Well, not exactly. Also, a nice door grab there to skip the animation of hopping out the car. But yeah, the red suit is level 31, which means there's no use for it. From here, we get to stop Vaughn from talking, so we have to be really fast and do photo mode to pause our dialogue for a split second, and then we can talk to Vaughn right away. If you don't extend your dialogue using photo mode there for a small second, Vaughn will talk, which does waste time. Proceeding on here, we have a little bit of sanctuary stuff to do. So right off the bat, you know the drill, just like every visit, we're gonna run to that bridge, and we're gonna talk to Lilith. <sighs> Some things don't change, do they? Like save quitting, let's do that. Then from here, we gotta run up to the front of the ship and look out the window to see Troy do his thing. Sadly though, I'm in a hurry, so Troy, I'm gonna have to take a rain check, buddy. Um, you can show me your magic tricks later on. That is, if I don't shoot you in the face with my Hellwalker first. The objective did check off, let's go for that safe put one more time here. 
Then we'll run our way up to the bridge one more time here and talk to Lilith, and then we're going to be off to the next map. By that, I mean we're heading over to the cathedral. So we'll slide our way forward, don't say goodbye to anybody else, talk to Lilith, and then off we go. Not easy. Now, we are going to have a little bit of mobbing to do up ahead, but honestly, it's not too difficult. We'll take care of it pretty quick. Now, notice right there we did not get a blue warp tunnel. Yeah, for some odd reason, blue warp tunnels don't appear every time, but I still have to go for a safe quit to split my segment. We'll talk to Vaughn real fast and do another save quit. And what that's going to do is kick Tannis forward to the next objective. If you don't save quit there, there's like 30 or 45 seconds of dialogue. And we definitely don't want that. Now these guys driving alongside me can be trolls. In fact, you can see there he does bump me a little bit. I don't know what it is. They just don't like me and they just want to knock me off the cliff. Anyways, we made it over. So let's go ahead and jump up here and place clone up top. I was trying to get it to place through the window there, but it did place on the right side. Either way, not a big deal. The clone's still up there, so we're good to go. We'll finish off the last few guys here, do the clone teleport up, and then we're going to trigger Tannis. At this point, we're waiting for a long animation, so we might as well rush over and kill Hot Carl. Now, Carl is going to give a nice chunk of XP, so that's why we're killing him real fast. Like I said before, we're only going for the XP because there's literally nothing else we can do at this point. We'll rush forward, and do keep in mind that he does resist fire damage, so we are going to be using the Hellwalker. Oh wait, who cares, he's dead. Anyways, we teleport back to our car, and while we're warping to our car here, you can actually hop out of it. So we jumped out, and the animations just got done, so perfect timing. So we'll slide our way to the next map. This map is pretty exciting, we are going to be doing a Pestilence jump, and also another Out of Bounds. So we'll save quit to skip the animation of jumping out of our car and also just split our segment. From here, there's going to be a nice wedge spot not too far ahead. So we will stick our head into the ceiling of this crate and quickly put on our last stand artifact. And then we'll do a nice long charge to get across the map. Right before the fast travel is a required waypoint, so we're going to be landing right there. So after walking in the general direction I want to fly, we're going to slide over to this area to make sure we don't hit an invisible wall. Off we go. If you are wondering why I look straight up when I fly, uh, the flight speed that you have is based on your frame rate. By looking at the sky, not all the details blow your feet. That's going to give you a lot more frames for more distance. From here, we pop on our snow drift, and we're going to slide our way through the waypoint that's required, and then hit the fast travel. At this point, Ava's way behind us, so we're going to go for a save quit to kick her forward. Now we're waiting for Ava to walk towards the door and check off the objective, so in the meantime, we'll just get a quick kill. There we go, she checked off. Then we got to go for another save quit here, because Ava despawns for some odd reason. We'll load back in, and Ava's going to be back. Now we'll place down the bomb and shoot it to blow up the door, and inside here is going to be required mobbing. Luckily, the spawns are pretty consistent in this area, so you know where they're going to be. So we'll kill all the enemies down below while the dropship is flying in. We'll get the final three dudes here. There we go, number two and number three. Then Malawan's going to drop off their enemies, and we're just going to completely destroy them. They're all dead. At this point, you can see we're just about level 29, and remember, we got a level 29 Hellwalker from Grave Ward. As soon as we get this level up right here, we're going to speed equip the new Hellwalker. There we go. And that's going to give us even more damage. Do we need it? Mm, not really, but eh, more damage is more damage, right? The first mobbing area is complete, so we can proceed forward. And look at the waypoint. Yeah, the second area of mobbing is not required. That means we can do this really cool out of bounds and skip waiting for that door. Once you get over here, you can fall right through the window and get yourself back in bounds. There is a safe station right here, so we're going to fall down and hit that and then go for a save quit. Guys, we only have 20 minutes left for this run. Yeah, think about that. We still have all of Necro Tefeo, but it's not that long. Anyways, we'll spawn in and grab the switch a little bit earlier. But there is a required waypoint we have to hit right here at this uh, location, so we touched that. Because we pulled the switch early, the door is already open, so we don't have to wait for that slow door to open up. Now we'll wait a second for Rachel to spawn and get the uh, two-shot kill. Because we did kill the boss so fast, the objectives are going to pop up early. Now we got to turn the four valves, so there's number one, two, and three down below. The fourth one has a nice parkour skip, so we're going to do that now. You can jump off the light and make it all the way up top there. We'll shoot the tank and drop down, and we're going to be off to kill Troy. That is Cathedral. Not a whole lot to it. I do want to make sure I get a perfect fight, so we are going to waste all of our action skills and slide forward and hit the save. Then we're going to go for a save quick to refresh my action skills. Time for Troy, and Troy has a pretty interesting glitch. If you wipe out all of his HP before he can jump into the arena, then you can skip the phase 1 immunity and go straight into phase 2. So if you time it just right, you can see here, we just go straight into phase 2 and wipe it all out. Sadly though, we cannot skip phase 3, so we're just going to wait for a split second here. But as soon as the immunity phase does end, we'll get that one-shot kill on the final phase and finish him off. I know it did look like I shot through the immunity phase, but I did not. It's just really good timing after many resets. From here, we did go for a safe quit to skip the dialogue and race our way to the Typhon Log. We're going to grab it real fast as we slide by. Then from here, we're going to head inside the vault and get the alien thingy. 
Yeah, that's going to be all of Pandora, and then we're going to be heading off to Necro Tebeo pretty quick. We'll talk to Lilith think go for one more save point here. And now the vault's going to open, and we can get the alien thingy. Again, guys, I did record this segment a while ago, so I kind of forgot the progression. That's all. After the warp tunnel, we're going to slide our way to the artifact, pick it up, and then we're good to go. I'm afraid it is that time again to head back to Sanctuary, but we're not going to be there very long. Before we head over though, we have to talk to Tannis real fast, and then we're going to go for a save quit and activate any add-on at the main menu, and that's automatically going to put us in Sanctuary. That will be a little bit faster than opening your mini-map and traveling manually. Now that we made it back, we're going to head over to Tannis' lab. Also, I should mention that even though it does say spend skill points, at this point, skill points don't matter. We'll bust out our new alien QR code scanner and scan that. And we'll go for a safe quit because Tannis has a story to tell us. Just like 99% of Sanctuary visits, we're going to go to the front of the bridge. And once we get there, another story has to be told, but we don't have time for that. We have to save Pandora, so we got to go for that save quit. Now we can head to the bridge and travel our way to Necro Tefeo. For the final planet, we're going to complete that in 17 minutes. We'll spam most of our action skills and place clone right here. That will allow us to teleport back and make our way to the dropship even faster. Now, the Out of Bounds in Ava's room is still the same speed. Uh, the drop pod will not let you travel right away, so it doesn't matter which one you do. We'll go ahead and sit here for a little bit while waiting for the drop pod to let us travel. And Zane's going to go ahead and laugh because he would love to pestilence fly to Necro Tefeo. But we cannot do that. Obviously because space is cold and uh, no oxygen, right? Mm -hmm. We'll load into the map and then do a save quit to refresh our action skills. Now, Necro Tefeo is a pretty interesting planet. There's really not a whole lot of things we gotta do here. I mean, there's gonna be more pestilence, flying, skips, and all that good stuff. But I mean, as for like the objectives, there's not a ton of stuff to do. Anyways, we'll do a mantle over that piece right there and then proceed to the mobbing area. These mobs are gonna be required and the cool thing about this area is no enemies have guns. It is super duper easy mobbing and probably some of the easiest mobbing in this run. I did reset a few times to make sure we got a bunch of these flying dudes because they are pretty easy to hit. We'll kill off the final two over here and then proceed to do a clone teleport. We can place the clone through the crack in the barrier right there. The button over here is required to hit, so we're going to hit that real fast. There we go, and we'll clone teleport back. From here, we're going to run all the way to Typhon's hideout. Now, I did try a pestilence jump over, but it turned out to be a little bit slower. I mean, I guess it makes sense at this point because we have so much freaking speed. And also, we're going to get a nice dialogue skip up ahead. You can see that Tannis is talking to us, but we're going to pause that dialogue with photo mode. That means that Typhon's robotic friends cannot talk to us, so the cave's going to open early. We'll freeze it for just a small bit of time there, and the objective is going to kick forward. And now we're going to go for- wait, what was that? Ooh, you guys are catching on, you're right, yeah, we're going to be going for a save quit. And even more save quitting. Now it's going to be time to meet up with our good friend Typhon DeLeon. And I gotta say, this guy, he- hmm, he's something. Listen to this, are you ready? What took you so long? What took you so long? Dude, I'm freaking speedrunning. I guess it wasn't fast enough, but I'll, I'll try better. From here, Typhon's gonna slowly walk his way towards the objective. In the meantime, we're gonna derp around by having two Typhons play. And I do have to stand by him a little bit here to make sure he moves forward. So we don't want to get too far away just yet. Once we do, we're gonna place our clone and try to head to the Pyre of the Stars early, but the game doesn't let you. Yeah, it is unfortunate. No skip here. Or I should say, no skip, dude. We'll teleport back, and now we're waiting for Typhon to whip his way down here. Right here is going to be a 50-50 dialogue skip. If Typhon says behind this door, you did not get it. If he says this dialogue right here, then that means you did get it. What that's going to do is save about 20 seconds by making the vault keys pop up early. So we can place those down and go ahead and get back to the fast travel. So now we're going to be heading over to the bridge. We do need to race our way over there really fast because we're going to be going for a triple dialogue skip. We are going to slide over there because at this point, Zane is faster than the car. So we're going to be doing a couple action skill cancels along the way. Level 30 has been hit too, but like I mentioned before, these skill points don't really matter now. Like, no matter where I put them in the tree, it's not going to give me more damage or anything. In fact, it would waste time opening my inventory to spike the skill points, so that's why we don't do that. You can see there we hit a waypoint and Natron's talking. This is where we got to be fast and race our way to the mobbing area. We'll run up here and start the mobbing, but we don't want to kill them off just yet because the waypoint hasn't popped up. Now it popped up, so now we can finish off the last of the mobbing. That's going to be the first dialogue skip, making the mobs pop up early. The second dialogue skip here is going to make the Arbalist spawn in early. So we clone teleported through and we'll finish them off real fast. Now for the third dialogue skip, we're going to go ahead and skip over Typhon by pausing that dialogue. And that means we're going to destroy the barrier a lot faster. There we go. Yeah, getting all three of those dialogue skips is quite a rush. Anyways, we'll trigger the invisible waypoint and then travel back. 
And then from here, we're going to head over to General Tron. Now, the reason why we're not safe quitting here to skip the warp tunnel is because if you save quit, the mission will not proceed forward. It's one of the weird missions that don't kick forward. The waypoint that pops up on the minimap now is optional, so we're going to skip over that. Also, we'll go for a save quit to make sure we can split that segment. We're coming up on General Trant, and General Trant is just a copy-paste Captain Trant. All he is is a slightly healthier Malawan Heavy. Along the way, there are going to be a bunch of Guardians, but these first few spawns are not required. In the second area, only the ones in this back corner are required. If you don't kill these specific ones off, the door over here is not going to open. We'll skip the Guardians right there, and then go over to Trant. I'm going to say right now, Trant is not going to be alive for very long, so there he is, there he isn't. Hellwalker for the win! Yeah, for that fight, we got a nice sliding critical hit, so Violent Momentum and Hellwalker easily got the one-shot. Guys, I do have some bad news. We are about to do our final Pestilence jump for this run. Yeah, I'm pretty sad about it too, these are pretty fun to watch. But at least this one's going to be a nice little finale because we are going to be doing a pretty big jump, and this skip is going to save almost a minute. The funny thing about this map is there's really not that many waypoints, so you can see on the minimap that we just have to hit that waypoint over there. So we're going to fly our way over and get almost a perfect landing right next to that waypoint. We'll go back to the snow drift and make sure we have our speed. And then inside the temple's just going to be a little bit more mobbing. Luckily though, there's not too many spawn locations in this area, so it is fairly simple to watch all of them and take them out fast. We'll take out these enemies who have been imprisoned inside these crates. Kill the one in the back and kill the Robo Dog right behind me. And then the final spawn happens in the same location every time, so we'll just watch that crate. There he is, take him out. That easy. From here, there is quite a bit of dialogue, and sadly, we cannot save quit this because there is no save stations nearby. In fact, if I save quit, I spawn all the way back at the beginning of the map. That would not be good. Anyways, Typhon says that the giant red gusher has power, so we'll pick it up and place it into the slot over here. Right after placing the giant gusher, we do have to be fast because we are going to be going for another dialogue skip, which means we do want to take out Preston as fast as we can. By shooting the core, we can get a nice one shot and then shoot it again to skip the animation. And from here, we have to pause the dialogue to make sure that we can extend it a little bit longer. We'll place the gusher again, and then we're going to go for another dialogue skip. So we'll freeze it one more time here. That will make the elevator controls pop up way earlier. There we go. From here, we have to wait for an animation-based thing, so no skipping up of that. And then we'll hop on the elevator and go to the next waypoint. You can see here the weapons are four levels over me, and that means that we're four levels under the main story. Yeah, by the end of the game, the scaling kicks up rapidly fast, and if I recall, I think by Tyreen we're about seven levels under, I want to say. Either way, it doesn't matter, we're stupidly OP, who cares? We'll ride the slow elevator up top and then hit the save station and go for a save quit. Now, I was considering doing a rocket jump to get up the elevator a little bit faster, but then I decided not to because you can slide off that corner right there, and you get a nice boost forward. After we jump right back into the game, right ahead of us is going to be a little more mobbing. But the thing about this mobbing is you got to do it really, really fast. I mean, I know this is a speedrun and you want to go fast anyways, but the reason why we got to go ridiculously fast here is because there is a dialogue skip you can barely get. So what we're going to do is race over to the mobbing area while the dialogue's still playing. And this dialogue is barely long enough to finish off this mobbing and pause it with photo mode. We'll snipe the guardians or iridians, whatever you want to call them, as soon as they spawn in. After you finish the back and forth here, you're going to get a Berserker Guardian. You want to make sure you kill this guy pretty fast, and then you're going to rush your way over to the waypoint and do a photo mode. If you manage to pull this off, you can skip Typhon's dialogue and then activate the button right away, as you can see there. And look at that, the dialogue just ended, so that's all the time you had for that. Not a whole lot. From here, we're waiting for an animation-based thing, so skipping this dialogue somehow would not really matter. For the fun of it, I did place the clone behind the wall here by the one-way fast travel. Sadly, you cannot spawn there, so this doesn't do anything at all. Now we're going to do a really weird Typhon teleport trick. Um, after you save quit, you can see on the minimap that Typhon's waypoint is all the way at the grave. He is actually not supposed to be there yet. Yeah, the save quit puts him over there for some odd reason. In order to pull off this trick though, you got to be fast to the waypoint. Um, if you're not, the game will be like, oh wait, Typhon should not be there, and he will be teleported back to the beginning. What you want to do is stand in the area where I was standing right there. Once Typhon starts talking, you are good to go forward. That skip does save a big chunk of time too. From here, we're just waiting on a little bit of dialogue, so we will uh, do some parkour. We'll slide away all the way up here, and then we're going to do a slam onto Leda's grave. By the way, the slam does not do anything, but I was just burning time. Hyphen's going to finish up a little bit more dialogue, and we're going to dig up the grave real fast. And then we'll turn around and get our clone in a good position for a clone warp. Right now, Typhon is talking, so we're waiting to grab the key, so we'll place our clone by the vault. And then we'll proceed to race our way back. As soon as we get back, though, the vault key is going to be ready to be picked up. We're going to grab that and clone warp back to our clone. 
Now we're waiting a small bit of time so we can place the vault key. Right after that, we can head into the vault and finish up the rest of the map. That is all of Tazendir Runes. It does fly by pretty fast. That was not a pun, by the way. I know we did do a Pestilence Flight, but I will shut up now. Just kidding. We're going to be going for another dialogue skip here. So once Typhon runs up here, we are going to pause this dialogue to lag it behind. And then we'll grab the Iridium Fabricator one second earlier. I know a second doesn't sound like a whole lot, but think about how many times I've said that for this run. They really do add up. After we grab the loot cannon, we're going to go ahead and save quit and activate another add-on. And that's going to place us right back in Sanctuary. Remember, we don't have to open our mini-map and travel manually, so this does save time. Also, yes, I did derp up at the main menu a little bit there, but it didn't waste time, so all good. From here, we're going to rush forward and have the arms face dialogue overlap. That means we can pause this dialogue over Tannis and charge the vault key right away. So we'll skip over Tannis, place the vault key, and we'll skip over her again. And that means we can instantly charge the vault key and go back to Necro Tefeo. More specifically, Desolation's Edge. We're not going to be there very long though, because we're going to be heading off to uh, Pyre the Stars. I didn't mention it either, but sadly, that was our last visit to Sanctuary. Man, I know how much you guys love seeing these Sanctuary segments. Anyways, now we're off to the Pyre of the Stars. So all we gotta do is place the Vault Key and then run our way to the door. Now, the door does open a little bit slow, so we are gonna get there before it actually lets us travel. So we'll spam the Interact button until we can travel. Pyre of the Stars is quite straightforward, and there are gonna be some pretty cool skips. So I can't wait to show this off. From now, we are done with a lot of our items, so we're just gonna sell those off. And we are also gonna sell the Iridium Fabricator and then buy it back to make sure we can auto-equip it. So that means we can use the Legendary Firing Mode to get a specific item. I won't spoil it just yet, but I'm pretty sure you guys know which one it is. Like I said, we're gonna buy back the Iridium Fabricator. That's gonna auto-equip it to slot number three. Before, we had the Pestilence on slot three, but because I sold it, the slot three became empty. From here, we gotta wait for these guys to run forward, so we'll wait until that checks off, and then we'll go for that save quid. Come on, Typhon, buddy. There we go, let's go for the save quid. We'll run ahead and give Tannis the vault key and then go for a save quit. And that's gonna skip over her dialogue because we don't wanna listen to that. You know, I wonder, how many times did I say dialogue for the speed run? Probably like two or three times. This skip is really cool. So what we're gonna do is get all the guardians mad up ahead. And what we're trying to do is get a specter to chase us over to this area. And if you have type and enter combat before entering this area, the game is gonna get a little bit confused and thinking about this whole area. With that in mind, you can see there Typhon's gonna check off and then we can place the vault key right away. Such an odd skip, I still don't know why it does that. From here, we gotta get super lucky and have Typhon teleport forward. Uh, right now, Typhon is really far behind mobbing all the guardians. So up ahead, we're going to encounter combat and Typhon's gonna think we're in trouble and need help. So we're gonna mob the guardians here, hit level 31, and Typhon's gonna be like, bro, I wanna help you with that mobbing, so I'm gonna go ahead and teleport forward and... Boom, here I am. Sadly though, this is the only area where it works, and the two areas up ahead, I really wish it did work there, but it is not. From here, we're gonna do clever parkour to get up ahead faster, and Typhon is slowly running over to the button to tell us to click it. In the meantime, you have to kill one or two mobs here to trigger the guardians at the end of this area, so we killed them off real fast. From here, we'll place clone to skip the jumping part after hitting the switch, and we will jump down and hit the switch as soon as we can. After that, we're gonna teleport right back up, and Typhon's gonna follow alongside, but all we care about at this point is to kill the guardians at the end of this area. Once you kill off all of them, the door is going to open and we can go forward. These guardians are going to be the same and always spawn in the same location every time too. So we can watch these spawn points and kill them as soon as they spawn in. Final guy right here. And now the door is going to open and we can skip all that COV mobbing. We'll jump our way up and hit the save station right here. Right after we can place the vault key and then go for a save quit. Save quitting will put Typhon at the next waypoint, which means we don't have to wait for him to slowly run over. For the parts up ahead, we don't have to mob any enemies in this first area. As long as you're not standing by an NPC with mobs around, they're not going to stop and fight mobs. That means if we go way far ahead, and not too far because we want to make sure Typhon keeps moving, then Typhon's going to run through that first mobbing area and not kill anything. For the second mobbing area though, we do need to kill these guys off. Um, they're actually not required, but if Typhon stops to fight stuff, then yeah, that would slow us down and we definitely don't want that. I do think I worded it pretty good, but just to make sure, first area, we're not over there, Typhon's going to skip them. Second area, we are here, which means that Typhon would mob, and that slows us down. There we go. We cleared all the mobs, and now we're just waiting for Typhon to run over. And luckily, there is a save station in this area too, so I can go for a save quit later on to skip his dialogue. The rest of the Pyre of the Stars is kind of slow because we're waiting for Typhon to run over. Like I mentioned before, nobody knows any ways to skip Typhon forward. So we have no choice but to wait it out. Come on, Typhon. Why don't you, like, slide or something, or maybe put on a snowdrift? That'd be nice. Um, save quitting right here is bad too, because if you do that, 
He would spawn all the way back at the beginning, and that would be really, really bad. Just a little bit more to go, and to show our disappointment, we're going to shoot Typhon with a rocket launcher. That lets him know that, hey, I'm trying to go fast, man. Typhon shrugs it off because he really doesn't care. At this point, I'm watching the minimap to make sure I can safe put at the right time when the waypoint disappears. You see that? There it goes, it disappeared, which means we got the waypoint, we can go for that save quit. Now we'll run forward and hit the switch to activate the door to open, and then we'll save quit to skip the door opening animation. Once we load back in, the door is going to be open so we can slide through and proceed our way to the end. And just like that previous area, this mobbing is all not required either, so we're going to skip all the mobs except for the guardians all the way at the end. These guys are not required, but I do want to kill them off to make sure Typhon doesn't stop and fight them. We'll finish off the final guy, and then we're going to go ahead and go back to the beginning of the map. Um, at this point, we're waiting on Typhon again, so he has to run all the way over here. While waiting, I'm going to be a little bit more productive and get stuff done. We'll jump back to the first location and mob this area for no reason. Again, we're waiting on Typhon, so you might as well be doing something. Luckily though, we are going to be setting up a dialogue skip right after this, and that means we can skip over Typhon telling us to place the vault key. This dialogue skip is only going to save one second, but hey, again, time save is time save. We'll finish off a few more mobs here for some XP that we don't need, and then we're going to do a nice little rocket jump. If you guys are familiar, there is the Hammerlock Hunt enemy at the end of this map, and that means we can kill off Broodmother and trigger some Hammerlock dialogue. So we'll do a rocket jump to the back area, and then from here, I gotta make sure I can set up my clones and teleport back. Funny thing is, the end door right here is not solid, so we can run right through it, and then we will place our clone right by the pedestal. Now, this Hammerlock Hunt dialogue is not very long, so that's why we gotta make sure we do a clone warp back. Right there, I did mess up the rocket jump, but we're still waiting on Typhon, so it doesn't really matter. And then we'll run ahead and take out the Broodmother. Hammerlock is talking away, so we'll warp back and then pause that dialogue. From here, we gotta wait a long time for Typhon to run all the way over. While we are waiting around, we're just gonna mess around in photo mode. Guys, I wanna point out, we only have 3 minutes left for this run. Uh, there is not a lot more to do. I use blur in photo mode, but you can see in the distance, there's Typhon de Leon, and he will slowly, slowly, slowly make his way over to the pedestal. For real, why can't I pick this dude up and put him in my backpack? If we would've just went Banjo-Kazooie style, we could've been done with this area by now. Typhon is just about here, but because Hammerlock is talking, that means he cannot talk, which means we can place the vault key right away. After we place it, we're gonna warp to the beginning of the map and then take on the final bit of mobbing. This mobbing will look kinda crazy, but for the most part, these spawns are gonna be the same and the locations are the same too. That means after enough resets, you can memorize where everything spawns. Remember, we still have the Iridium Fabricator, which means we can swap to Legendary Mode and get ourselves, well, a brand new Hellwalker. Honestly, it's not going to help a ton, but it's two levels higher, so why not? At this point, we're waiting for Tannis to talk one more time, and then we can go for that save quit. And I will skip over the rest of the dialogue and animations and start the mobbing right away. This mobbing is pretty fast, so don't blink. Uh, as usual, our goal is to get those critical hits and get those ricochets going off. And then we can take out all the enemies with speed. From here, you get a guaranteed sniper, we'll take him out, and then you get a bunch of tanks in this one location right here. So we'll swap your low kill all of them as they spawn in, and then the anointed hack will be right here on the left side. From here, you get psychos in the middle, and then car door guys on the right side. And after you kill off the car door guys, you get a guaranteed anointed goliath right in the middle. We'll build up speed and two-shot him. For the finale, you do get a few psychos on your left and right side. You might notice right now, we are still getting those spines from early game. Yeah, now is the time where we're going to be doing the dialogue skip. We'll finish off the final few, skip the cutscene, and count to 10. Right now, Lilith is walking over and she's about to do a set of dialogue. But if you wait those 10 seconds and pick up a spine, Marcus will overlap Lilith and then she cannot talk. That will make the mission complete right away, and then we can go for that save quit. Just a little bit longer here, it should complete. And then we can take on the final boss and call it a run. There we go, save quit. Now, I will say I am a little bit sad we didn't get sub 2 hours and 30 minutes. But this is still a really, really fast run. Also, I did mention early on the Grease Trap can bypass Rampager, Troy, and Tyrene. Unfortunately, the Grease Trap I have right now really dropped off, so it's not going to work great for this boss. Either way, her immune bases are pretty short, so we can take her out pretty fast. We'll skip that cutscene, and just like Grave Warden Agonizer, we are going to go full auto mode with the Hellwalker by abusing the Swap Reload glitch. You'll notice there I do pause and unpause really fast. That is only to fix my reticle on my screen because for some odd reason since day one, after a cutscene your crosshairs become gigantic. There really isn't much to the fight, we just kind of pre-spam before the immune phase ends, and once it does the HP just gets deleted. Only a little bit more to go, and I gotta say right now guys, if you did watch this full video I do appreciate it a lot, and I really hope I was able to entertain you guys even if it was only for a couple hours. 
Now for the final bit, we'll spam away, and as soon as we get that cutscene, that is going to be time. Also, dying there does nothing. Time. 2 hours, 32 minutes, 42 seconds. Not a bad time at all. Anyways, that's going to be it for the 600k video. I really hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, I'd hate to ask for it on a video like this, but I did put over 100 hours of work into this run. So if you could, please leave a like and a comment on the video. It would make my day. Thanks for watching again. I hope you have a great day, and yeah, I'll see you later. Peace out.